beforehand? Um, you can just announce that we're opening the meeting on the date and stuff. It's great. Okay, well, uh, today is uh, January 10th, uh, 2024. Happy New Year to everybody. We're uh, opening the meeting of the Amherst Conservation Commission. And uh, uh, first step will be uh, um, will be land management uh, updates, uh, I suppose, uh, Aaron or Dave. Are we we're good to go here. Yeah, Dave, do you want to give a little land management update? Sure. Yeah, I'll be very brief because I know you've got a lot on your agenda. Um, well, it it's kind of you know that time of year for some planning. Where I just had a meeting with Brad Borderweek, our land manager, today, um, beginning to chart out kind of what 2024 will look like in terms of projects. Um, we are, it's a time of year where, you know, we're, we are plowing a little snow where, you know, after the big storm, we did open up many of the parking areas uh, for um, people to use the conservation land for hiking and cross country skiing and whatnot. And uh, now we have the, the big melt, um, but we'll be sitting down over the next couple of weeks, looking at um, kind of the backlog of projects and what we think is realistic uh, for 2024. Um, it's also a time of year to do equipment maintenance, so we'll get tractors, trucks, uh, brush hogs, things like that into the shop, and um, we do most of our, all of our own maintenance, unless it's kind of high level, level stuff that we need to ship off to John Deere, so we'll, um, we'll get that equipment into the shop uh, up at Cherry Hill in the next uh, month or so. Um, we will, winter is a great time to remove down trees from trails. Again, there's probably 60, 70 trees across trails all over town. And after last night, I bet there's a few more to add to the list. So Brad and Anthony will be um, trying to um, prioritize those. I know right before the holidays, they were working on a really big tree that came down across the trails at Larch Hill. And then there was another one, I believe, over near Amherst Woods that was precariously over one of our new boardwalks. So they took care of those in, in short order. Um, other things that are going on out there in the in the, the world of conservation, we're also getting ready to bid uh, the trail project at Hickory Ridge. Aaron has been working with a consultant we brought on board, Bob Parent, and um, the project is ready to get out there on the streets and see if there's interest from the the uh, world of, of construction to get that done. We're hoping we get a rob robust response to that. Um, and then uh, finally, Aaron and I will be meeting with Brad on Friday. Um, the Department of Conservation and Recreation recently <laughs> put out their annual uh, call for proposals for the DCR Trails Grant program. And um, Aaron and Brad and I will be meeting on Friday to kind of do a little brainstorming on that. I think the likely focus will be the Robert Frost Trail and maybe some associated connecting trails, but there's plenty to do on the Robert Frost Trail. Um, we've gotten those grants in the past, small grants, 30,000, 20,000, 40,000. My inclination this year is to go kind of go big or go home. There's a lot of administration with that grant. So why not try to, to go for more money and get more things done? So we might be in the hundred to two hundred thousand dollar range, and see if we can get some money for bridges and and um, some real trail improvements on the Robert Frost or other other nearby trails. So, so that's kind of a quick smattering of of what's going on out there um, in in the in the conservation field work. I see Alex has a question. Thank, thank you, Dave. Yeah. Uh, Alex? Yeah, I'm uh, just dealing with my computer here. Tells me I have low resources. Is that Dave on the, on the trees coming down? A couple of quick questions. I, just you, you, I think you come, you're coming in pretty broken there, Alex. Is there anything that you could do uh, to to make it a little better? Yeah, I've been trying to reduce the resource of being used. Um, you know, I'll be, 
I'll skip it. Um, Do we still have you, Alex? Uh, uh, there we are. Can you can you hear yeah. us, Alex? You you could always Alex. Alex could always email me offline if if you have questions. Happy to answer them by email. <clears throat> Alex, um, you you may you may want to um come out, meaning uh, exit, and then uh, try and rejoin, try another uh, connection. Okay. Thanks. Do you guys want me to um, sort of carry on with other stuff while we're waiting? Okay. You may as well. Yep. Okay. Um, let's see. So just a quick update that um, town staff are working on the, um, as I mentioned at the last meeting, the update to the open space and recreation plan. I think you guys could probably expect that for the duration, I'll be doing sort of a, a an update for the commission um, or Dave will of where we're at with the um, plan development process. Um, right now we're working on a final draft of the survey. It's a community survey that goes out to the residents in town to basically um, find out what their opinions are relative to um, uh, where things need repair, where, you know, new facilities are, are wanted or new lands for acquisition, um, maintenance and um, repairs, all that kind of stuff. So um, that'll be coming to you guys soon. And when it comes to you, it's probably going to need a relatively quick turnaround for comments um, because we're kind of coming up on a tight deadline to get the survey out to the public. So just be on the lookout for that. Well, I'll let you know um, when I'll need comments back to have them received to incorporate into the into the survey before it's released. And then I think, oh. You're still very broken up, Alex. Looks like he's going to try to rejoin here. Yeah. Maybe you could take his question when he when he uh, gets back on. Aaron, is there are there any other updates that you could give us in the meantime, or? Um... Um, I guess one thing I'll note is that um, the there was a request for a minor administrative change to an order of conditions at Thirty Kestrel Lane. Uh, that <clears throat> permit will be uh, that review of that request will be tabled um, until the twenty fourth. Also, just in case anybody um, is attending from the public, um, the Stonefield Engineering and Design LLC on behalf of um, Valley Community Development for the Ball Lane Notice of Intent, that one will be continued to 7.30 on um, January 24th. Also, the Pure Sky um, Development on behalf of WD Coles for the... Um, ANRAD application on Shootsbury Road will be continued to January 24th at 7.35. And the um, SWCA application on behalf of the University of Massachusetts for the um, parking lot 13 on Olympia Drive will be continued to January 24th at 7.40.
And then lastly, the last item on the agenda, which is a new notice of intent, um, that one will also be continued to January 24th at 7.45 p.m. So just in case anybody from the public is on to attend, that they know that those hearings will be continued to the meeting on January 24th. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah, I don't know what to do about Alex because we don't have a quorum without him. I think, I think we'll, we'll have to wait for him. Yeah. Yeah, so for anybody watching, we um, we have a seven member board and four members make up a quorum. So in order for us to continue with business, we need to have four Conservation Commission members present. And Alex is having some connectivity issues. So he left the meeting and he's going to try to rejoin. Aaron, he, he could call in, right? I mean, he doesn't have to be, doesn't have to be a video, right? He can still call in and participate, right? He could. He did try to call in previously, and I know he ran into some kind of problem with that, too. Um, hmm. Yeah. No, what is going on? So for those of us uh, just joining us, uh, we're waiting for our uh, fourth uh, Conservation Commissioner to join us in order to have a quorum to be able to continue uh, this meeting. And uh, Aaron's announced uh, already, but in case uh, you didn't hear it, um, we have, uh, I believe it's uh, five hearings that are, or four hearings that are continued till uh, the next meeting at on January 24th. And that includes the Ball Lane housing project, the uh, Pure Sky uh, uh, Coles uh, ANRAD, the uh, SWCA UMass um, uh, project, um, 260 Leverett Road, uh, the NOI for 260 Leverett Road. Um, and I'm not sure if I mentioned 30 Kestrel Lane. Um, they're all going to be continued to January 24th. And there's Alex. How are, we, how are you hearing us, Alex? I'm hearing you fine. Can you hear me? Perfectly. Yeah, I went in and got rid of some stuff and free up some space. All right, good. So you had a question for Aaron when uh, uh, when you left. I had an Aaron, uh, a, a question for Dave, but I can move on or just ask them quickly. I don't know where you are. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, Dave, uh, on the trees that came down, uh, I'm just curious, did the ground lift up or did they break? And how big were the trees? Oh, uh, yeah, real quickly, um, I don't know, you know, until people start reporting them, which probably has already started from this, you know, storm that happened last night, I don't know how many came down on our trails um, you know, just last night, um, my guess is a handful. Um, but we probably have, I don't know, 40 to... No, I wasn't not asking, not asking about how many. I was asking about... No, no, no. I'm answering your question. 40 to 60 trees that are down all over town. I don't know off the top of my head which ones may have broken off or, as you point out, come up from the roots. I don't know. Um, it's 
curious because uh, in talking with Mr. Cotton, who runs a tree service company, he's told me that with the increase in frequency of high winds, which um, the, 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 the winds that topple trees, he said, used to occur about once every 10 years, but they're happening more frequently. So on large trees, the roots fracture and don't have time to heal before the next big wind. Mm. And so a tree, and I had a big white pine in back of my house like this. And uh, <clears throat> all of a sudden the roots, the, the real fibrous roots and everything can't support the big tree and it comes down. So mm. he said, we are losing, uh, going through a period now where we're losing big trees because of this increased frequency of high winds. So I was mm. just curious on what's, what's coming down uh the nature of the fall and i'll get back to you on it yeah yeah we'll um it's an interesting comment from from uh the folks there at that that company but yeah you know also i think when you get the super saturation of soil too the roots just you know yeah. these things just pop up and you know they create great habitat right they become kind of mini vernal pools out there in the forest but uh but <laughs> yeah i will uh ask brad to kind of keep a mental note of what, what he's seeing out there on the trails. I had six trees come down on my road up in New Hampshire where the where the ground just lifted up and the whole tree came down. Mm. And I spent quite a bit of time cleaning them up. So I'm just curious what's happening here. Yeah, we should. Thank you. That's it. Gotcha. All right, Aaron, anything else uh, in terms of updates or should we move to the minutes? Um, If we could do the minutes, that would be great. Okay, so we have uh, we have available uh, right now um, minutes from uh, November 29th of 2023, um, also from December 13th, 2023, and uh, we have a couple of drafts of uh, minutes from uh, June uh, 28th and um, August uh, 9th of 2023. Um, Alex's comments uh, were uh, incorporated into uh, the 1129 uh, 2023 um, draft. Uh, is there are there any uh, co any further comments or any uh, anything that uh, we needed wanted to discuss on uh, the 1129 uh, minutes? Um, okay, then, uh, I guess what, what we're looking for, uh, how about any comments on, uh, the, uh, on December, uh, 13th comments or issues with. Okay. Um, what about, uh, uh do we have comments or issues with, uh, June 28th, 2023 minutes? and uh august uh, 9th 2023 i'm not hearing anything uh so we're looking for a motion a motion a move that we approve those minutes i second that okay um that's uh alex with the motion and jason with the second um bruce Aye. Jason? Aye. Alex? Aye. And I'm an aye. Great. Do you want me to jump in to get some other business taken care of before the hearings? Okay. Um, so the first is that uh, we had an emergency certification request from UMass. Uh, this is on 950 North Pleasant Street. This is related to the two culvert replacement projects or the one culvert replacement project that's underway. Um, this was a notice of intent that was filed um, in response to an enforcement order out there. Um, and they, I've been um, monitoring it. We've been getting monitoring reports. Um, the site looks looks really good. Um, the, the problem was that uh, in the course of doing their stream restoration work, um, basically there was some changes to the stream sort of geomorphology as the um, uh, work was done to create the splash pools that were below the outlets of the culverts. And it basically created um, 
what was described to me as a thal wag that was pushing into the right of way. Um, I went out and inspected it and it basically carved out, I would say, five to 10 feet of the right of way um, in the stream channel or the stream channel moving towards the right of way because it kind of rerouted itself to the low point. So um, the request was basically to do some um, stream stabilization on the right of way side and then some stabilization on the opposite side um, to sort of um, reestablish the channel so it was flowing away from the right of way and not um, into the right of way. So they submitted a plan to us and um, I issued the emergency certification. They did have one um, request to change the emergency cert, which was to start work on January 11th rather than the date, which was previously noted. Um, and that was basically because of high water, they've had to um, sort of slow the pace of the, the culvert work a little bit um, because we've had so much rain. So I would just ask the commission to ratify the emergency certification with the revised start date of January 11th, 2024. Okay, uh, any comments from anybody? Oh, uh, looks like Bruce has a... Oh. So... Well, take Jason first. I'll I'll try to use my raise hand thing. Okay. All uh, right, uh, Jason. No, my question was just: Is that realistic? Are they really going to start tomorrow with all the creeks and everything being as high as they are, or does it matter? Um. Yeah, that's a good point because the um the request was put in a few days ago to ch to make this change. So they may I'll coordinate with them, and if they do need the start date to be pushed back a few days, um, that is an easy sort of administrative adjustment that can be made, um, to the order just to make sure. And I can certainly express to the consultant that we are a little concerned about the work being done during the high water conditions. Um, I think they're just they've got, they're mobilized out there. So they want to be able to sort of seamlessly start on the work as soon as um, the water levels allow them to. Well, we have to, like, are we going to have to go through this again? To change no, the no, something administrative <clears throat> like that, I can just adjust. It's really just to make sure that the commission um, understands the scope of work and um, is, um, in agreement that the work has to take place. And so that's basically what the ratification is. Okay. Rose? So is there any chance that the what you showed in the pictures is five times worse now than it was three days ago? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it, it there is a chance of that. And I wouldn't be surprised in the least if that was the case. What I do know is that they are planning to dewater because this is a very unique situation where they there there's two stream channels that it starts as one and then it sort of breaks apart and comes back together. So in this case, they have the ability to dewater the side that's causing the scour. So that's their intention is to dewater that culvert to do the work in the dry. Um, and then once the work is done, they would open the both the channels back up again. So the stream flows no matter what. Um, it's just a matter of what culvert it goes through. Um, okay. Yeah. So the question. Go ahead. Um, so they're going to put a coffer dam in in the stream. Yeah. So what they've been doing is putting uh, sandbags in front of um, one culvert or the other, depending on which one they're working on. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. We and have channel. They... We have channel forming flows going on right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. What time do we have now? It's seven twenty-six. There's yeah. a motion, Andre. Yes. Uh, there's a motion on the chart on the 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 sheet here. Yeah. Okay. So uh, what we're looking for now is a motion uh, uh, regarding this emergency uh, certification. Yeah, I will move to ratify the emergency certification issued to the University of Massachusetts for stream stabilization at 950 North Pleasant Street with the noted revised start date of January 11th, 2024, subject to change, mm -hmm. and end date of February 10th, 2024. 
Second. Okay, we've got uh, Jason with a motion and uh, Alex with uh, with a second. Um, Alex? Aye. Jason? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Phenomenon. Uh, so that motion uh, is passed and it's ratified. Um, and now we move to uh, enforcement. Yeah, so um, in your packets this week, you will see an enforcement order that was issued for 11 Trillium Way. Um, there was two issues. I was contacted by the building department about um, fill that was being brought in. And then uh, about a day later, I got an email from an abutter basically raising concern about fill that was being brought onto the site. I went out and did a site visit and discovered that um, the limit of work line had expanded about 140 feet from where it had been approved or where the, the plan showed the limit of work. And um, there was not supposed to be any work other than um, tree pruning in the 100 foot buffer zone. And uh, a large amount of fill was pushed into the buffer zone um, onto the top of a slope and down a slope. And that material um, basically carved out rills and gullies and washed down the slope and washed over the erosion controls, which were not being maintained properly, and off the property owner's property and onto um, property which is owned by another entity. Um, I was out there and basically ordered them to immediately stay. When I was out there, everything was frozen solid. Um, so there was no removing the sediment at that point. Um, so I, at that point, advised them to um, stabilize and repair the erosion controls immediately. Um, I sent them a plan that detailed exactly what I wanted them to do. Um, they brought in wood chips to stabilize the areas that were washed out with the intention that the wood chips would stay in place until thaw conditions when they could get in there and pull the, the fill out. Obviously, we have some thaw conditions today. So, um, you know, but I, I think that considering the amount of rain that we're having and the freeze thaw cycle, it would be advised that they wait until um, spring and until things dry out a little bit for them to um, get in there and do the, the full restoration plan. Um, but that's basically what the situation is. There's a, a pretty good slide deck of photos um, in the enforcement order that kind of highlight what the what the issue was. Okay. Um, any questions? Um, Aaron, what uh, this project? Can you? elaborate more on what was it just pruning that was supposed to occur what was the project actually supposed to be yeah the um the project was the construction of a single family home on an undeveloped lot on trillium way which is in amherst woods um the the a request for determination was filed and in the request for determination the request was to prune selectively prune trees within the between the 100 um, foot buffer and the 50 foot buffer line there was not supposed to be any work beyond the 100 foot buffer mm -hmm. we asked for um, a limit work was not supposed to be anywhere close to the buffer zone um, it was supposed to be um significantly away and downhill on on an opposite slope from the buffer so it wasn't there wasn't supposed to be any impacts to the buffer we asked for a um a limit of work to be installed by way of an erosion control barrier mostly just so that at the 50 foot line it was clear where the pruning limits were um and the applicant did come back after the permit was issued and say basically they wanted to cut some additional trees on the 50 foot within between 50 feet and 100 feet and the commission denied that stating they were concerned about the stability of the slope. Um, I went out inspected the erosion controls the erosion controls were a little closer to the wetland than I wanted them to be but there was some sort of 
disputing back and forth, shall we say, between myself and their representative about about that. And I kind of backed off and said, it's, you know, there's not any work going on within the buffer zone. So I kind of stepped back a little bit and said, um, okay, to keep the keep the the fencing where it is, but you know, they, they knew what the rules were. Um, but the the work was significantly beyond where the limit of work line was shown on the plan. It was not supposed to be, there was not supposed to be any grading or fill anywhere near the 100 foot buffer. Um, it was well away from the 100 foot buffer line. And um, now there is fill that is in that area, basically where the tree pruning was supposed to be. So it was definitely a significant um, encroachment and also a significant um, uh, step away from what was approved by the Conservation Commission. This project have a. I'm sorry. What was that, Jason? Does this project have a SWIP? No. It's less than an acre. Yeah, it's a probably a a half acre lot. I would assume. So. So let let me just kind of put this into uh get get a little perspective here so these folks applied for a uh applied for the permit initially yes and were it was approved with conditions correct and it was uh, uh and they were notified what they where they can uh do their work and where they can't yep there were specific that. trees marked yep and after that, they went ahead and uh, um, essentially violated the uh, uh, the uh, floodplain or uh, area subject to flooding or the uh, the buffer zone. The buffer zone, yeah. So it was it was a determination of applicability that was issued, a negative determination that was issued um, for um, selective pruning only within the buffer zone, and the buffer zone was to an intermittent stream and also to bordering vegetated wetlands along that stream. So there's the slope that can't, comes up from the stream um, going towards the property in question. And um, that's where the violation occurred. I see. Uh, what, <laughs> okay, so uh, we've, uh, we're looking to issue a uh, an enforcement order. Um... Well, it's already been issued. It's issued. Um, okay, we're gonna and, and ratify it. Right. Oh, so it's just be basically ratifying what I've asked them to do. Um, and so all of the requirements are spelled out in that document. Um, did did you guys want me to go over what the requirements were that I spelled out for them? Or I don't know, you guys might have it up on the um OneDrive as well. Mm -hmm. Um I'm, I don't need to see it right now. Um okay. we do have a lot, a lot, uh, a lot of business. Um so what so uh what they're going to do essentially is right the wrong that they did now is there any uh anything else uh that we can do about this um well I mean, what I'm, i guess where i'm going is to me this seems somewhat egregious when uh, they uh knew they needed a permit initially uh got it through us were uh kind of given the parameters of what they uh, could should do and uh, went ahead and uh, blasted through uh, whatever they wanted to do. Um, I'm putting it in certain terms, but uh, to me, it, it seems uh, fairly uh, like a, a quite a knowingly um, type of uh, violation here. So just putting that out for discussion. Yeah, yes. I mean, I go ahead. I'm sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Aaron. I mean, I think that they're, 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 the site plan wasn't followed. Um, and that for me is the big issue. There was, there was a site plan that had grading, existing, and proposed conditions. There was a limit of work line um, that indicated where the limit of clearing was going to be located. And they, they didn't follow that plan. So I think that's really, um, 
by way of additional things that we could do, I mean, you could mm -hmm. basically state that you want to revoke the determination of applicability. Um, you could um, require them to survey where the 100 foot buffer line is and um, have them you know, see if they encroached in the 100 foot buffer with any of the tree removals. Um, you could ask them to do additional restoration in the 100 foot buffer. Um, again, we, you know, I've asked them basically to um, remove by hand any of the fill that was dumped on the slope and all of the fill that went down the slope um, into the resource area. And they've been ordered to repair the erosion controls. Um, so, you know, anything that you think is necessary beyond that. And certainly we don't have to um, decide that tonight as well. Um, if the commission wants to ratify this enforcement order and continue to monitor it, we can also um, mm -hmm. modify it at any future time um, to include additional parameters that the commission wants to see out there. So it's it's entirely up to you. Okay, that that, that makes uh, that makes a lot of sense that we can revisit this uh, at some other point, uh, probably after a site visit. Be nice to see what's uh, another site visit, see what's going on there. Okay, uh, Jason. Yeah, I was just gonna ask. Yeah, this this occurred it appears on the third, Aaron. You went out there, or the third is when you prepared this violation. I prepared it the same day I went out. Yeah. Okay, so that was a week ago, mm -hmm. and uh, we just got hammered last night. And, yeah. You know, the combination of melting snow and rain. This probably looks ten times worse now. Agreed. I know they were out there the day after doing um, silt fence repairs and putting um, uh, mulch down on top of the um, fill area just to try to stabilize it temporarily because it was frozen solid. But I 100% agree with you. And I'm also very concerned about it. Um, slopes are, especially with fill on them, are, I think, extremely dangerous. So I'm definitely concerned about the site. Yeah, and that from all the pictures, it was hard to tell in the pictures where the, you know, kind of 100 foot buffer limit was and the, you know, on the 50 foot buffer. But I got to imagine anything that was even remotely close to the 100 foot buffer at the top of that hill is now at the bottom of that hill. It and was making it its way. <laughs> it was making so its way. Yeah. If we ratify this violation uh, and then we do a site visit, and I'm asking for clarification here. Is there yeah. a potential to issue another violation based on, you know, what happened, you know, last night's rain event? Absolutely. Um, so what you could do is is ratify it and say that the ratification is subject to change um, and that the commission would like to have a site visit. And I can organize a site visit to get out there. And I would love to get your eyes on it, Jason, for any suggestions that you have for um you know, additional stormwater measures or stabilization measures. Um, you know, I was just trying to get something down on top of the fill as soon as possible. Um, that was something that the landowner could manage quickly um, mm -hmm. because it was pretty bad when I was out there. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, so Unless we have any other uh, comments or questions, it uh, looks like we're looking for a motion. Could we modify the motion before we act on it? Or, yeah, there we go. Like it's set. All right. So I move to ratify the enforcement order issued to Amir McKechi and Carl's excavating at 11 Trillium Way. Enforcement order will be subject to change based upon a future site visit. Second. All right. So we have uh, Jason uh, on a motion, Bruce on the second. Um, Bruce. Hi. Jason. Hi. Alex. Hi. And I'm an I. So it's ratified. 
Um, now we're going to move on to uh, hearings. Um, unless there's any uh, anything else uh, that we need to, you think we need to do, Aaron. So nope. uh, just a quick uh, quick review about hearings. Um, there's some general. Uh, we've got the general procedures uh, for fairness. Each um, hearing has uh, 20 minutes on the agenda. Uh, five minutes are going to be comments from staff. Five minutes uh, for the applicant to uh, uh, present uh, their case. Five minutes for public comment. Uh, and we ask that you keep it down to uh, two minutes or less per person uh, and uh, five minutes uh, for the conservation commissioners uh, to uh, to review uh, the issues. Um, Robert's rules of order, uh, essentially, uh, don't interrupt other people um, and uh, raise your hand if you uh, wish to uh, wish to have the floor and uh, speak to the uh, chair. Um, for those who didn't realize for today, I'm the chair. Um, is there anything else that I should uh, review there? Um, just that if, if there's any revisions, um, they should be submitted by November, or no, as of November 1st, uh, all revisions should be submitted at least a week prior to the subject hearing for um, just distribution to Conservation Commission members. And then anybody who is speaking should just state their name, address of the project, um, who they're representing, if they're a representative, if they have preferred pronouns, and members of the public, if they could also announce their name, that would be helpful. Thank you, Erin. Uh, Bruce? Um, I just would encourage all of us who are on the call to, to be as succinct as possible and try to stick to these time limits. We've had a couple of meetings recently where we, we weren't done before it felt like the cows came home. So let's just all try to stick to the time limits. Thank you. Good, good point, Bruce. Thank you. Um, so we now uh, move on to the uh, first hearing, uh, which is for a request uh, for determination uh, by uh, Mass uh, Department of Transportation. Um, before that, I'm going to read out uh, um, I'm going to call this uh, call it to order. Uh, this public meeting is now called to order. This meeting is being held as required by the and by the provisions of uh, Chapter 131, Section 40 of the General, General Laws of the Commonwealth, an act relative to the protection of wetlands as most uh, recently amended, and Article 3.31, Wetlands Protection under the Town of Amherst General Bylaws. Uh, the re request for determination was received uh, in, by mail, I suppose. Is that correct, Erin? Received by mail? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, and do we have a date when this was received? At uh... oh, it, you don't have to go into all that that stuff. The, okay. Just the uh, initial paragraph is fine, Andre. Alrighty. Um, so with that, uh, we go to uh, staff for uh, for uh, for your initial comments. Sure. Um. So we received the application from MassDOT. This is for um, repaving of the um, Route 116 corridor between Hadley and uh, Meadow Street. Um, the work um, involves milling and resurfacing, rebuilding and cleaning of draining structures, up, uh, upgrades to the guardrail and shoulder repairs. Um, so just to give the commission a little bit of background, this type of work generally um, the repair and resurfacing of roadways is considered um, a minor activity and exempt activity as well under the wetlands or under um, the Riverfront Act. Um, in this case, uh, there's a couple of reasons why the applicant came to us. Um, partially because I think the the work um, on the the shoulders might be a little bit outside of the the road footprint, but also because um, under the riverfront provisions, if work um, 
work is within the riverfront area, but also with another within another resource area, um, then that would trigger the need for for permitting. So then in, in that case, they wouldn't be entirely exempt. In this case, um, the resource area also contains bordering land subject to flooding, which is why they've filed a permit. Um, I walked the site with the applicants and I'll um, pull up the photos. I'm sure that the applicant would like a few minutes to present, but um, just really briefly, um, I don't have any problems with the proposed work. The only sort of, um, I guess, outstanding thing was that uh, on the site visit, it was expressed that they're not really ex um, intending to do any work beyond the, the road footprint. So there's a couple areas that are um, paved swales where water flows off of the roadway into um, the adjacent um, area. <laughs> and they're not intending to re replace any of those paved areas. If they come across a catch basin failure, I was told that they would come back to the commission to update us on the need to replace it. Um, but at this time, we're just anticipating it would be pretty minor um, repair work and and um, repaving. So um, I'm just going to stop sharing and see if the applicant is here to jump in the room. Um, and also, I'll pull up um, some photos. And I think, um, Billy, if there's anybody else from MassDOT that's here to present, please raise your hand. Um, but I just allowed Billy to join the room. And I have photos to share as well. The commission would like to see them. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Billy Lee. My preferred pronouns are she, her. I am the district environmental engineer for MassDOT in District 2. Um, can I share my screen to just share a couple PowerPoint slides? Yes, absolutely. Okay, great. Um, it's saying that I, oh, no, okay, got it. Perfect. Just had to try it one time before it worked all the way. Okay, so um, I'm going to keep it really short and sweet. Um, so this project is for resurfacing and related work on Route 116 in Amherst and Hadley, but obviously we're just going to be talking about the Amherst portions tonight. Um, this is a very high level locus map just to show you guys um, where the portion of the project is. Um, so we're basically going from the intersection of Meadow Street and 116 down to the Amherst-Hadley border. Um, we're stopping just short of the intersection um, for the repaving. So before it kind of breaks up into that um, yield um, and turn into Meadow Street. Um, so basically the need for this project is deteriorated pavement um, in need of resurfacing. I'm sure you folks drive that road a lot. It's quite bumpy. There's some ruts in the road. So um, it really needs some repaving in the area. Um, here's just a quick scope of work, which is included in the request for determination application. Um, this is essentially milling and resurfacing. Um, as Aaron said, you know, while they're while they're resurfacing, um, if they need to adjust a catch basin um, to meet the elevation of the roadway, or if they see a deficient catch basin, um, you know, they would replace it in kind. But when Aaron and I were out there just walking the site, there were most of the catch basins were in very good condition. So that's unlikely to happen. Um, there are going to be some um, upgrades to guardrail. Um, I've talked to our designer about this. This process is very straightforward. It doesn't require any excavation. There's basically like a specialized machine that pulls the guardrail out and then pounds the new guardrail post right in. Um, the ground, like on the edge of road where the guardrail is, in current conditions is not soil and grass, it's actually pavement millings. Um, and so when they go in and kind of scrape an Aaron, this is like, I had conversations with our designer after you and I had our site visit to kind of clarify. So when they're going in and scraping um, the edge of the road kind of to restore areas of country drainage, um, what is below that debris that kind of piles up on the edge of road is actually pavement millings so they will not be loaming and seeding that because that would defeat the purpose of it is so right now that is part of the roadway footprint is the edge of the road where there's milling and pave uh, sorry roadway millings um and then it becomes grassed area um so just a clarification on what that work is um so this is just a schematic to kind of show you guys um there is one crossing in Amherst, which is the 
if you can see the very small text in the bottom left corner, the A-08-025, that's just the bridge code for this um, road stream crossing. In those areas where the project is going over a resource area, we're adding um, sediment and control barriers. There is curb there, so it's not anticipated that water would even go up over the curb, um, but we're just putting the sediment control barrier as like a conservative um, measure to make sure no sediment goes into the Mill River there. Um, this is just the item number in the contract of how it will be communicated to contractor. Um, again, those bridge codes are in there. The two H's are in Hadley and the, the A is in Amherst. Um, and then these are the provisions for exemptions. So, um, you know, this project, it's for this portion of the project, it's all resurfacing, um, which is considered a minor activity under 310 CMR 10.02 2B2. Um, it is, you know, within the riverfront area of the Mill River and within um, buffer zone of wetlands, which are two resource areas where minor activities are exempt. Um, there's actually bordering land subject to flooding in the areas adjacent to the roadway, but not the roadway itself. Um, but nevertheless, we are milling two and a half inches and then paving two and a half inches. So um, there's no change in elevation or anything like that. So no, no need for compensatory storage here. Um, so in summary, this work is exempt, but I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody may have. Okay, um, I, I guess I'll I'll call on people. Bruce, <laughs> do you have any questions? Um, um, it can I'll, wait. I'll... In, it can wait until it, uh, the commissioner has its time. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Billy, Billy uh, most of uh, usually what will happen is uh, we're going to we the staff has uh, given a presentation. Okay. Now you do. Okay. Now, then the public is going to uh, get a chance for questions, and then mm -hmm. the commissioners are going to do that. But sometimes uh, questions uh, come up uh, uh, directly addressing what you're saying and uh, mm -hmm. need to be asked. So awesome. Looks like Jason has a question. You can take public questions first, Andre, if you want. All righty. Sounds good. Um, if there's any member of the uh, public who... Uh, has questions regarding uh, regarding this uh, action, uh, please raise your hand now and we'll uh, get you into the panel. <clears throat> and Aaron, I'm not sure if I uh, have that ability to, to do that or not, but- uh, Yeah, I don't see anybody raising their hands. Um, I, I did make you co-host just in case somebody raised their hand while I was sharing my screen because I can't see them, but um, I don't see anybody right now. Yeah, I'm seeing that now uh, where, where it says allow to talk. So, okay. All right. So, uh, looks like there are no questions from the public. So, uh, Commissioners, uh, Jason, may as well start with yours. All right. Thanks. Thank you, Billy. Um, the You mentioned that there's a number of culverts on uh, throughout the project area. Uh, so not, it's not culverts, sorry, catch basins, inlets. Yeah. Um, are those uh, catch basins, especially any ones anywhere near the resource areas, uh, going to have some sort of filter fabric, sediment bag, something in them to potentially catch any? Of yes, the there will that, be um, there will be silt sacks in the catch basins. Um, I, um, yes, yeah, silt sacks are specced into the project. Um, I have to, yeah. Yeah, no, the, the silt sacks are, are specced and let me just make sure that I'm saying that correctly, but yes, they are, okay. the items are in there. Yeah, I just wanna make sure because the grindings, mm -hmm. they can get in those inlets very easily. Yeah, absolutely. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I thought there was a question from Bruce. Bruce, did yes. you? So would it be fair to say that you either have or will talk to the Hadley Conservation Commission in the same way you're doing with us, and that the project would then be done all as one piece, not in two parts? You're not doing Amherst one thing, and then it's just the whole thing. So mm -hmm. can you comment on that? 
Yes, absolutely. I we actually received our negative determination from uh, Hadley last night, um, and this is all one project. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks, Bruce and Jason. Bruce, your hand's still up. Um, so it uh, looking fairly fairly straightforward. Um, any other questions from the um, from our uh, commissioners? Um, okay. Karen, can you put up the motion because I don't have it. Yes, and I I would like to also put up the conditions as well because I drafted um, conditions associated with this. Um, so I'll just throw those up on the screen really quickly. Um, there, I don't want to read through all of them, but basically um, that there would be a, um, a pre-construction meeting where the contractor would sign off indicating that they've read and understand the order, um, that they would be required, the contractor would be required to install and maintain all of the erosion controls and environmental controls. Um, that there was no change to the elevations in the roadway, um, no material stockpiling or excavation proposed or approved beyond the road shoulder and maintenance. Um, if any of the catch basins need replacement, that we would have additional communication with the applicant. Um, contractor would um, ensure that none of the materials, trash, debris, or any any other materials um, make it into the resource areas, they have to stay contained. Um, and then um, no resource area or buffer zone is proposed to be altered as part of the application. So those are the special conditions. And then I included our standard boilerplate conditions. Okay. Um, is there some way that you can uh, share the uh, page five or tile five of the uh, of our um, PowerPoint? Yes. Okay, there it is for uh, whoever's ready to uh, make that motion. I will move to issue the negative determination of applicability checking box two. However, special conditions and boilerplate conditions under the Wetlands Protection Act shall be required and attached to the determination as drafted. Second. All right, Jason on the uh, motion, um, Bruce on uh, the second. Bruce? Aye. Jason? Aye. Alex? Aye. And I'm an aye. So the uh, negative determination uh, uh, has been issued. Fantastic. Thank you all for your time and consideration. Thank you, Billy. Thanks for uh, for presenting and uh, for taking the questions. Yeah, absolutely. And Erin, um, I just want to confirm that you, you'll you send it the uh, hard copy in the mail. Yes. Okay, great. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night. You too. Thank you. So um, we're still on. Yeah, we're good for uh, hearing number two. Uh, hearing number two is a no notice of intent. Um, by uh, Horsley Written uh, Witten Group um, on behalf of Town of Amherst for uh, proposed reconstruction of uh, Fort River Elementary School. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, start this uh, notice of intent hearing. Uh, this hearing is being held as required by the provisions of Chapter 131, Section 40 of the General Laws and of the Commonwealth an act relative to the protection of wetlands and most recently amended uh, as well as recently amended and article 3.31 wetlands protection under the town of Amherst general bylaws. Um, again, like I was saying, uh, it's uh, uh, being brought by Horsley uh, Witten Group, uh, Denisco uh, Design and uh, Brown uh, Sardina, Sardina Incorporated on behalf of the town of Amherst. Um, and with us here, I see we have uh, Janet uh, Bernardo, and I'm sorry that if I mispronounce your name, and Amy uh, Ball. So, uh, 
with that, I'll uh, turn it over to Aaron for uh, administrator uh, comments, staff comments. Yeah. Yeah, so just a quick update on this. Um, the applicant did provide some additional information to us, um, which is in your packet. Um, some of the um, buffer zone number calculations, as well as um, uh, some additional details on the project. Um, just to call to your attention that there was a sort of discussion offline in between the last hearing about the playground surfacing. Um, there was a, a memo in there, and so um, at this point, I'm prepared to issue the order of conditions tonight. Um, the the one thing that the commission should be aware of is that the applicant has requested that we approve the order of conditions, essentially with no playground surfacing at this time. Um, it would, you know, be be stabilized with grass seed um, at the current time, and that the applicant is still working with the school building committee um, and other boards and committees in town to determine what the surfacing that will be proposed on the site will actually be. But because of um, bidding, uh, they need to get an early bid package out. They'd like to get the order of conditions in hand so they can provide it to the contractor and come back to the Conservation Commission once they've determined what the surfacing will be to get um, an additional approval for that. Um, so that's that's basically all I have. The only other comment I would say, you know, as far as the buffer zone alteration, um, there is an increase in the um, buffer zone alteration numbers, but I think that the applicant is doing quite a bit of um, resource area restoration, including some restoration of bordering vegetated wetland and also some restoration of um, flood zone. So there'll be additional compensatory storage on the site and they're also doing some invasive species treatment. So I do think that they're doing quite a bit of mitigation associated with the project. And I think that the commission should take that into consideration. That's basically all the comments I wanna share. Thank you, Erin. Um... So with that, then, uh, who would like to uh, kick it off uh, with um, for the applicants, um, if there's anything that you wanted to add? Um, and hi, good evening. For the record, Amy Ball, a senior ecologist with the Hoysey Blanton Group. Um, I don't know that we have much to, to add um, from what Aaron had said. We just had submitted additional information from the or since the December 13th uh, hearing with the commission, uh, which included the natural heritage letter that we received um, that required some uh, turtle turtle exclusion fencing. So we've incorporated that into the, um, the early site package that will then carry through mm -hmm. um, all of the phases. Uh, they wanted some silt fence in place. Uh, we have also updated our O&M plan um, for our discussions last time and have submitted a letter of understanding uh, that was signed by the town and school department outlining the responsibilities for the maintenance of um, the well, operation and maintenance of the um, various stormwater facilities um, and also to identify that the DPW would be responsible for mowing and maintaining the playing fields. Um, as Aaron mentioned, we, uh, there was a separate letter submitted by Answer Advisory, who's the owner's project manager, regarding the, the surfacing of the, of the play areas. Um, and then, at, again, as Aaron mentioned, we do have a, an updated clarification and breakdown of all of the uh, resource area alterations and buffer zone impacts and um, mitigation areas that we broke out by phase, including the early site phase, phase one, phase two, and then sort of the net um, change in, in condition. So I, I guess I can just turn that back over to the commission. Um, I believe you probably have the table we submitted um, as uh, that Aaron referenced, but I, I have a, a screen of it if you need to see that. Okay, thank you, Amy. Um, Bruce, did you have a question for now? Uh, and after the public, Okay. All right. If anybody from the public uh, has uh, has any questions, please raise your hand, and we'll uh, we'll bring in to the uh, discussion. <clears throat> I see no hands up right now. Um, 
we'll go ahead and move to the uh, commissioners and then we'll do another check on uh, on the public again. Go ahead, Bruce. So uh, Horsley Witten Group is the consultant to us. The, the town is actually the applicant here. Is that correct? That is correct. And so I'm sorry I didn't grasp from the materials who from the town is the primary project manager. I believe it was your town manager that, that is serving as the town's applicant. So not our, our Dave Zomek, who is the assistant town manager. Correct. Okay. That's it. Thank you. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, do we have any other questions from the uh, uh, from the commission? I'm seeing that uh, there is somebody uh, from the public with a raised hand. Um, let me do what I can here to get uh, Margaret Wood into in here. Margaret, you are you're good to go. Uh, hi, can everybody hear me? Yes, I can. So, um, Bruce, just to answer your question. So the owner's project manager, which is my role, um, I'm essentially uh, working as an extension of the town. So I'm the consulting project manager for the project, which is why I wrote the memo providing you with the information you were looking for. But um, hope that answers that question. Okay. Thank you, Margaret. Looks like Alex, uh, Commissioner Alex Orr, has a uh, has a question as well. Yeah, sorry, I didn't come in earlier. I'm re oh, fixing my microphone. Last time we met, there was a question about the cost that the schools incur uh, for a whole variety of things, and folks were asked to uh, come back with some information about whether or not the school was prepared to undertake those costs, uh, and I. This is from memory, so I, th I know Dave interacted on this subject, and uh, uh, Aaron was a, was I think about to contact the schools, and Dave said that he would much rather have the consultants contact the schools. So my question is, did you, and what did they have to say? Um, I'll start on that as a response, and and um, Steve or or Janet can back me up. I think your question is related to the operation and management plan or the O&M plan. And yes, that. And um, the town um, town manager and your um, superintendent of schools have signed this. And this outlines the, um, the responsibilities, including the costs, and notes that the town um, is responsible for the financing and the continued operation, maintenance and required emergency repair. School department will conduct the general housekeeping and inspections and removal of trash and minor repairs. And then the DPW will be responsible for more major repairs as well as managing the, the playing fields. Um, so that, that Im implies, I believe, that they would also cover the financial costs that associated with these um ongoing maintenance and i just follow up with that real quick we we had a kind of a team meeting with the dpw the town manager the school committee school department um rupert and kind of talked about who was going to be responsible for which piece and everybody understood we kind of went through the stormwater management plan and the and what needed to happen on the site long term and everybody seemed to agree. We updated the O&M plan. They reviewed the O&M plan and signed the letter. So I, as, I, as I think about this, I, I might be wrong on the cost, but I think it was something like $23,000 a year. It's a, it, we reviewed it a little bit closer and it, depending on who does the work, as a consultant, we kind of assume that the town may hire somebody. So we put in those um, prices. But if the school department, their, their maintenance group 
is able to do some of the lawn mowing as well as some of the picking up the trash and kind of inspecting the catch basins, which is more a looking in the catch basins. And then the DPW is able to come in and do a cleaning of the various structures when the school department says, we noticed a significant amount of sediment in the catch basin or in the um, four bay. Can you come with your heavy equipment and clean that out? That's kind of the agreement that everybody went along with. So even though our price um, appears high, it's really if they are hiring an outside um, contractor to do those services and they will be doing a lot of those services in town. So the, the last time um, the last time we talked, can you go back to the previous page? The last time we talked, uh, I think it was said that DPW doesn't have any responsibility for the schools. So this memo says differently. The last sentence in the first paragraph, school department will notify Amherst Department of Works for maintenance required and so on and so forth. DPW will, net, will mow and maintain the playing fields. Um, well, what about all the other stuff that has to happen there? Does, does the school have the technical capability to do what's required? The school will be doing the mainly the inspections, which we kind of explained what that entailed and the um, operation maintenance plan also further explains. And we have a kind of a detailed plan that shows where all the catch basins are and all of the four bays are um, to kind of explain what has to happen for each of those places. And um, when we kind of went through it with Rupert, he seemed to think, okay, his group could, um, I mean, there's some of it is sweeping and that they were picking up trash that they're already doing. Um, it's just making sure that that's happening. So they are not going to get out the shovels, but they are going to be using the eyes and um, marking off in the reports what needs to happen so that the DPW can come in and actually do the, the heavy lifting. And that was agreed upon between um, Guilford and Rupert. Okay. So forgive me for not having every detail in my head, but. No, it was, it was a discussion that you weren't there for. <laughs> not a problem. Okay. That's what you asked us to do. So we went off and did it. Yeah. Right. So for example, there, there's all the geothermal wells and there's other things that don't exist on other schools that uh, presumably the town or the school will have a hand in. And my question is, is can you think of anything where we might not have the technical capability to carry through? Well, so the geothermal wells are not part of the stormwater system. They are installed and then kind of left alone. Um, we were really talking about stormwater management, but in the idea of green infrastructure, is kind of low maintenance, easy to manage, smaller projects compared to smaller uh, practices compared to really large uh, kind of complicated uh, basis. I didn't, I didn't mean to drift away from our authority, but it, it was a... Uh... We think that um, what we are proposing, we're hoping that there is not a problem with them understanding. And we tried to... There's a lot of different practices, but they all basically do the same thing, collect sediment and try to avoid getting it into the wetlands. So it's now clear that the DPW will have a hand in um, managing, helping the school manage the, the uh, catch basins and they not, not just mowing and plowing. Right they agreed that they will come out when the catch basins have enough sediment that needs to be removed, the DPW will come and remove that sediment. Thank you. That's good to hear, Janet. Thanks, Alex. Um, Aaron? I just wanted to share, um, this This is the um, draft order of conditions, and um, I did share this with the applicant. It's pretty extensive, but in here, um, so part of the revisions that I requested were revised inspection logs. Those revised inspection logs account for every single stormwater structure that's being proposed as part of the project redevelopment. And 
in the order of conditions, it's required that those inspection logs be kept on site and be maintained and filled out on a annual basis. And those inspection logs have to be held um, at the facility um, and they have to be available by request to the Conservation Commission. And so we can verify that they're in fact doing their annual cleaning. So um, presumably after the first year of operation, we could go and say, we'd like to see all of your inspection logs and who did the inspections and that the cleanings were completed and verify that that's being done. Um, so it's kind of a checks and balance for the um, commitment that's being made by the town. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you, Aaron. Um, Jason? I just want, Aaron, is that like in perpetuity? Yes. <clears throat> Okay, is there anybody else who uh, has any other questions? Okay, well, with that, uh, unless there are any other questions, uh, we're looking for a motion. I think Aaron's going to pull that up now. I <clears throat> Oh, and um, I should note that in the in the order of conditions, um, in the language at the top, um, I'll just go back to it really quickly. I just want to point something out to you um, as we're voting on this. Um, there is a note at the top, and forgive me because I'm bouncing between like five screens. Um, there's a note at the top that indicates um, that per the memo from Margaret Wood, um, the order of conditions does not approve any playground surfacing, and that will be um, brought back to us for approval at a later date. So just to make sure that the commission is aware that that's built into the order of conditions that um, they're going to be returning to us for approval for that feature on the site. Uh, just to... Hmm. Go ahead, Alan. Yeah, Aaron, does that mean that um, when the bids... When the RFP goes out, they will not be bidding on on what we're excluding, and will they have to bid on that again? So um, there's the so I know you were on the site visit, Alex, and there was at the um, at the site visit we talked a lot about the phasing. So yeah. what they're bidding on right now is the initial phase, just getting the site preparation started for the. So yeah. that's what they're bidding right now. Um, they're going to hopefully solidify this and get an answer so that the next round of um, the bid Got process it. this will be included. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, so we're looking for a motion. Uh, I move to close the public hearing and issue order of conditions DP, DP number 089-0729 with boilerplate and special conditions as drafted under the Wetlands Protection Act and the Wetlands Protection Town of Amherst General Bylaws, Article 3.31 and regulations. Second. So we have Bruce with a um, with a motion, and I'm not sure that I hear uh, Jason a second. It is Alex. Alex uh, with a second. Okay. Mm. Alex. Aye. Bruce. Aye. Jason. Aye. And I'm an aye. So uh, the public hearing is uh, closed. Great. Thank, Thank you. you um, yep. Thanks, Amy, Thank you. Janet, uh, Steve, and Margaret. Bye. Right. Good night. Bye bye. Okay. So now we move to our uh, third hearing. Um, <clears throat> which is a uh, notice of intent. You now, just a uh, an issue of uh, order, if you would, uh, Aaron. Yes. Do I read the? Uh, uh, the public hearing uh, call again? No, right? No, no, not until we get to the last two hearings of the night. And sorry, my computer, my other computer froze. So um, I was trying to get this up. Um, yeah. So for the for the project, um, 
which actually the, the date is wrong on here. This was supposed to be 740. The 740 public hearing for Stonefield Engineering, um, this applicant has requested a continuance to the January 24th meeting. So uh, I've given them a hearing time of 730. So the hearing um, they've requested to continue to January 24th at 730 p.m. We would just need a motion to continue the hearing till that time. Um. I have a question, a procedural question. Sure. Um, is the applicant's not with us? That's a question. Um, is the applicant with us? Yeah. Um, they submitted the request over email, and I told them that they didn't have to attend um, since they submitted the request. Um, but I don't know if anybody's in the room for the applicant. I doubt it. Okay, um, so even though we have a motion to continue, um, is it okay, are we allowed to have any discussion about it? Um, go ahead, Andre. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, um, I I just think that uh, the best thing we could do is to uh, put it all together when when we're going to discuss. Uh, uh, when when the issue comes up rather than uh, now but okay I, I but i am curious to hear what aaron has to say i'm sorry i'm just throwing in uh, my two cents there alex Are yeah there i any, mean i generally if there, were, oh. if there were members of the public who wanted to talk about this would they be allowed to talk now or would they have to come back at a later date so I generally say it's at the discretion of the chair um, and really like sort of the discretion of the public. If people have like a burning question that they need answered or a burning comment that they want to share while they're in attendance, um, that's, you know, always a possibility um, in terms of like actually discussing the project. I generally like to wait until the applicant is here just because it's just in fairness to them to be able to respond to any questions or issues that come up. So, Chair, I would ask that if there are members of the public um, and if they had information to inform the commission, that they be allowed to do that briefly and perhaps come back at a later date with any additional stuff that they may want to say. That sounds good, Alex. Thank you. Anybody from the public who uh, would like to, uh, who had any, have any questions on this, uh, Please raise your hand. I see no hands so far. Um, do we have a, uh, I think we're looking I'll for- I'll move to uh, close the public, uh, <clears throat> sorry, move to continue the public hearing for 20, to 40 ball lane NOI to 7 30 p.m. 124 2024. Second. Okay, that's uh Jason with a motion and uh Bruce uh with a second. Bruce? Aye. Jason? Aye. Alex? Aye. And I'm an I as well. Thank you. Uh, hearing number four um, is Wendell Wetland Services on behalf of Eric Al uh, Olson for proposed restoration of uh, 2,300 square feet of a pond uh, by dredging and replanting at 20, uh, 296 Pomeroy Lane. Um, Aaron, would you like to start? Sure. Um, I see that... Um... We have uh, applicants representatives, so I'm just going to work on pulling them in while I sort of share my comments and updates on the project. If anybody else wants to speak or be pulled in as a panelist, please um, raise your hand and we'll pull you in. Um, so I have been talking with Ward Smith offline about this project. Um, you might recall that I did have a pretty significant list of um, sort of comments and concerns that were raised Um on the project initially, and um, there were uh, there was a revised site plan that was submitted on by the applicant 
the applicant's representative that basically sort of changed the whole concept of the plan. And so um, I've reviewed that. And the other thing that I've done in reviewing that is to draft a pretty um, comprehensive order of conditions for the project. Um, so what this does, and I'll, I'll pull it up for everybody to see if I can locate it, is um, to basically um, provide a um, essentially like a, a phased sequencing um, for the work to be done. Um, the first the first note on the I want to give the applicant's representative a chance to present this, but I just give you a quick snapshot of it. The first thing is that the site plan does not meet all of the plan requirements for notice of intent submission under our local bylaws. I do think the commission should consider accepting the plan, despite the fact that the plan doesn't meet all of the provisions of that bylaw. The reasons are that the pond is only jurisdictional. Um, under our local bylaw and not under the Wetland Protection Act. The pond is not a vernal pool. Um, the pond has no contributing upgrading resource areas and is stormwater and rainwater fed. The pond is being restored. Um, the pond was human con uh, constructed by humans and uh, conveys stormwater, which requires maintenance. Um, there is a failure in the emergency overflow, uh, overflow pipe currently, which is causing a public safety concern with water flowing into the road. And the owner applicant plans to complete the restoration by hand rather than with machinery. Um, I'm going to just pull the order of conditions up on the page so you guys can see it too while I'm reading. Sorry. Um, I've broken it out with special conditions that really strictly outline what can and can't be done, um, that the pond can't be drained, that the pond shall be dredged by hand. It will basically be dredged one half at a time. Um, and I'll, I'll keep these conditions up so you can read them. I'll give the applicant's representative an opportunity to get um, to do the presentation. But I do think that it's important that we allow the work to move forward, um, but also that we condition it um, in a manner that protects uh, downstream resources and protects the wildlife that are living in the pond. And I'll just leave it there and let the applicant's representative have a chance. Great. Um, so it looks like uh, Eric Olson is here. Is there anybody else uh, with you, uh, Eric, to, um, uh, who, I can't hear you because you're uh, you're muted so far. But if you hit that mute button, uh, we'll be there. You go. Um, I think is that Ward. I see. I'm not sure. I didn't. I don't notice. see Ward. Right here. Uh, I do. I, I think I see him. I see someone here who has an iPhone four one three so on and so forth. Is that uh, Ward right? He has there? his hand up and he's waving right now. No, that's not Ward. That's not him. That's not Ward. I've never met him in person. Sorry. Okay. All right, Mr. Olson, did you want to? Uh... Oh, there's Ward. No, oh, you got him there. Oh, yeah, here he's he is. Okay. he's he's just raised his hands. I didn't see him in the audience. So my apologies. No, he wasn't. Uh, he he didn't have his hand up uh, there. Words in now. Uh, <clears throat> and there's a, a man on the phone who I can't I can't record his name because I don't see it. I'm sorry, I don't know what happened. I was having trouble giving it getting in. I just raised my hand and that's what changed things. So I'll that's I'll great. just give a brief synopsis here. Um it's a a man, as Aaron said, it's a man-made pond that's fed by stormwater runoff. Um, I remember when I first uh, came to the area in the late 80s and drove by, it was a beautiful lotus pond, but the owner previous to Mr. Olson didn't maintain it, so it's gradually been filled in with leaves and mud and debris, and cattail have, have taken over. Um, so in conversations with Erin, we've modified our proposal significantly. So as she said, there's not going to be any machinery um, on the site at all. None of the material is going to leave the site. The proposal would be to use a turbidity curtain to split the pond into two sections and work on only one section at a time um, and transfer any um, aquatic organisms, which I'm guessing are pro primarily green frogs, using a hand net into the part of the pond that's not being worked on. 
and to dewater all of the uh, material adjacent to the pond um, so there's no runoff from the site. And after dewatering, all of the organic material um, would be used in the gardens on the northern part of the property. After um, the pond has been, one half of the pond has been done and the water's settled, then the other half of the pond will be worked on, um, oh, probably next summer. Um, there's a black walnut tree near the pond that the applicant would like to remove because that's the major source of debris in the pond and a couple of other trees that he'd like to um, limb up. And after uh, we've submitted our plan, Aaron, uh, in speaking with, I think the DPW um, said that there's a, a, an occasional problem with water running out of the pond um, into the road because the um, overflow to the pond has been broken. So Mr. Olson has agreed to replace that by hand that will require a sediment erosion control on both sides of the trench. And he will do that work by hand and then return it to lawn. So that's just a brief synopsis. I don't know if you wanna add anything else, Eric. No, that sounds right. Uh, thank you, uh, Ward and Eric. Um, now we'll go, uh, we'll go to the public and I would imagine uh, this uh, gentleman with uh, I, the iPhone is uh, here to to ask a question. Why don't you uh, unmute and uh, go ahead and start with your, uh, uh, if you would, with your uh, name and uh, preferred pronouns. And um, uh, hang on one second. Um, and your uh, address, please. You'll have to unmute though, if that if you're there to speak. I think he's working on it. There. Oh, there. there um, thank you. I'm not sure if I'm the person you're referring to. Yes, uh, uh, you you are. Are you here for this hearing? Uh, yes, but I I I wanted to speak to the ball lane project and i i know i i couldn't get in uh pardon me i i don't know how to work this if if it's too late i'll come back the 24th i'm sorry to bother you uh no no problems whatsoever um i i think i i would uh, love to hear you but i think uh your efforts are much better uh um if you if you present on the 24th sir okay can you still hear me Yes, we can. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm so sorry. I don't know the technology, and uh, I'll come back the 24th. I'm I'm in a butter. Just uh, thank you very much for caring, and I'll come back the tw I'll hope to come back the 24th and uh, know how to do this. Yeah, thank absolutely, you. absolutely no problem. No problem. I was trying no to get problem. in back there, but I I didn't succeed. Pardon okay. me, and uh, thank you so much for caring to do this. And uh, I'll go now. Absolutely, I'll, we'll I'll see you on the 24th then. Okay. Um, so we uh, looks like we have a no other um, no other questions just offhand. Uh, how about uh, commissioners? I see Bruce has a question. So not a question, a comment. Mm -hmm. um, I w I went on the site visit and met Mr. Olson and walked around and saw the things in place. And I read the special conditions pretty carefully since I did that. And I think they've come up with a really um, thoughtful, careful solution. And I would urge us to, to move forward. Thanks, Bruce. I, I agree with you uh, on uh, the fact that they've uh, done a, a good job of uh, a good job of um, of planning this. Alex. You're, you're still muted, Alex. There you go. Yeah, I wanted to ask Mr. Olson if he's been able to read the draft conditions. And I, I just read them very quickly. Um, the only thing I saw in there that I just wanted to make a comment on was is that I am trying to save whatever of uh, the lotus that's in there, which is not native. Um, uh, 
and then also add anything that gets added will be a native species. But I, you know, and I don't know how much of it I can save. It's 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 struggling. So you know, by the time the spring comes, we'll see. So I saw that one of the uh, comments is uh, it was uh, uh, number six. Yeah, I mean, I think <clears throat> I would defer to the commission on that if you're comfortable with leaving the existing um, non-native species that's growing in the pond, um, him preserving that and just replanting with native um, species. I wouldn't see an issue with it personally. I don't know. I'm not sure about the rest. I don't see an, an issue with it. It's uh, a problem. All right. So my my question, I, I still have the floor, I think, was uh, I just wanted to make sure that Mr. Olson has had a chance to see what it is we're voting on and read it and agrees with it. I mean, like I said, I'm just seeing it now. I've read it. It seems like it's fairly close to the uh, stuff that Ward had that I worked with Ward in drafting. Um, the only thing that I saw in there was the, you know, was the overflow pipe, which Ward had mentioned to me in advance and we had, you know, agreed to over the phone. So um, so as far as I can tell, it looks, you know, like what we talked about. And Ward, did if I could direct the question to Ward, then uh, did you see uh, and have a chance to read this before this meeting? I did not, but I've just glanced through it um, now, and it looks consistent with what we discussed with Aaron um, regarding the uh, the native plantings. I, I I think the you know I appreciate the commission saying that, um, but I think it's still consistent with this because. He wouldn't be planting any non-natives. He would just be moving what's there now. So I don't think the con the, the order conditions even needs to be changed regarding that specific item. Yeah, you know, out of fairness to the applicant, I I I just felt the need to ask. Yeah, yeah. I, I did. think it's, it's all consistent with what we discussed and agreed to. I did try to sort of tailor it to all of our discussions and also just looking at the plan and trying to be logical about sort of um, phasing it. So, you know, the dewatering would be on one side of the pond while the pond's being dredged. And then um, when the uh, that side of the pond is replanted and you expect to begin on the alternate side, the dewatering area would be re relocated to the side of the pond where the work was happening and the dewatering area would be stabilized. So then you could move to the second half. And then just, again, I don't know how you want to phase it, but it's more so just checking in at the phases um, and uh, making sure that there's erosion control protection for each phase. Yeah. And erosion control is silt fences and hay bales. Is that fine for that trench? Um, so for the dewatering area, I specified that you would use um, a uh, straw bale, like a, a circular straw bale um, configuration that's lined with some sort of filter fabric for the dewatering. Um, and then uh, for the, um, for the, just as an erosion control, straw wattle would be fine for the, um, for the, uh, replacement of the emergency overflow pipe, I specified um, silt fence and um, yeah. straw bale. And the reason yeah. for that was because you're probably going to have some water um, up against the, the outlet pipe. And so I was trying to just give it an extra sort of um, filter barrier. And or you could also reuse the turbidity curtain um, in that area if you'd like to. So like you could you could essentially reuse some of these materials for each phase. Um, and I'm definitely flexible on which controls you use as long as they're functional. Yeah, that's fine. And I've already found the turbidity curtain, fortunately. So, um, yeah, that, that's fine. Yeah, that's great. Good. All right. Um, any other questions uh, or comments uh, from anyone present? If not, then uh, we'd be looking for uh, for a motion. and. 
<clears throat> I move to close the public hearing and issue order of condition NOI 23-1630, where the boilerplate and special conditions is drafted under Wetlands Protection Town of Amherst General Bylaws, Article 3.31 and regulations. Second. We have Alex with uh, with the motion, uh, Bruce with the second. Uh, Bruce? Aye. Alex? Aye. Jason? Aye. And I'm an aye. So the public hearing is uh, hereby closed. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Have a nice night. Th thanks, uh, Eric and Ward. Uh, you have a good night, too, and uh, good luck with the project. Thank you. We have, uh, let's see. Hearing number five uh, is a, uh, uh, is Pure Sky uh, on behalf of Coles. Uh, Pure Sky is uh, going to be um, moved uh, or it's going to be continued. They requested a, a continuance to uh, the 24th of January at 7.35 p.m. With that, we need a motion. I move to continue the public hearing for Shootsbury Road and Rad to 7.35 p.m. on 124.24. Second. That was uh, Jason on... Uh, on the motion, and it looks like uh, Alex won the fight for the uh, for second. Uh, Alex, aye. Jason, aye. Bruce, aye. And I'm an aye. So this one is moved uh, moved to the twenty fourth at uh, seven thirty five. Hearing number seven. <clears throat> Is Please. it says uh, number six on the sheet. So are are you? I'm. Oh yeah, I just uh, skipped another one here by mistake. Okay. So here we are at uh, hearing number six is uh, SWCA on behalf of the U UMass, and uh, this as well is uh, uh, going to be continued uh, to. January 24th at uh, 7.40 p.m. And we'll need a motion for that. I move that we continue the public hearing for lot 13 Olympia Drive notice of intent at 7.40 p.m. on 124.24. Second. I, yeah. Okay, uh, so that, that, sorry. Yeah. Before, I thought we talked about this two or three meetings ago as to why this keeps getting pushed. Yeah, that was my question too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's completely fine to discuss it um, now that there's been a second on the motion. Um, I can give a quick update on this. Um, so the, the situation with this one is uh, that we've just been so... Um, busy with public hearings and applications that I have not um, checked back with UMass, mostly because I wanted us to come up for air uh, and clear some of these larger projects off of our agenda so that we could revisit that one and also just give them a little time to do their due diligence. Um, my hope was that once we get some of the um, projects off of the, off of the agenda that we could, you know, check back with them and get them back um, to the table for the to discuss the project and see what's going on but i just um it's been so busy that i have not had an opportunity to check back with them and i was a little afraid to quite frankly because our meetings have been so so long and um just a lot of business on them so that's kind of where things stand thanks Aaron. yeah they okay uh any other questions before we go to move to the uh vote yeah, just a comment. Um, as a commissioner, knowing that we have asked quite a bit of them 
with regard to this project, and some of it might be considered controversial. The perception with that explanation is that they're having um, internal conversations that haven't ended yet with regard to this project. I think that's a cogent way to describe it. And Aaron, do you have any insights? I don't, um, to be totally honest. I, I know UMass is, is very occupied right now with the culvert replacement project. They have a basically full-time monitor out there monitoring the, the um, culvert replacement and the stream restoration work. So I kind of feel like they're focused on that project at the moment. And this one's just on the back burner until that project is um, completed. It's kind of the, the impression I get. Thanks, Aaron. Anyone else? All right. Uh, let's move. Uh, we'll move to a vote. Um, Alex? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Jason? Aye. And I'm an aye. So this is, uh, uh, again, this is moved to uh, 7.40 p.m. on uh, January 24th. Um, now we'll move to uh, Hearing number seven, and Bruce, thanks for uh, putting me back on the uh, on the tracks there. Um, this is a, a Tetra Tech uh, on behalf of Fort River uh, Solar LLC for the construction and operation of a um, photovoltaic uh, solar facility. Um, Aaron. Yeah, um, so I'm just going to pull in the, um, the applicant's representative um, while we're getting settled in here uh, and give the commission a little bit of an update on uh, where things were left with the applicant. Um, <clears throat> so um, there were some plan revisions that were submitted to us um, with some final plan adjustments, which included um, some dimensions on the equipment pad, uh, the addition of the um, stabilized um, sewer line access for the DPW, as well as some um, uh, notes under where the um, construction trailer would be located for um, how that would be stabilized. And we did have a meeting, myself, um, Dave Domek, uh, the fire department, in, uh, electrical inspector, uh, the town engineer, and the applicant, and the applicant's representative were all present. We, we discussed sort of where things stand with the Conservation Commission, where things stand with the, um, the batteries in question, um, and um there there is a memo um from the applicant in the project folder that sort of gives a brief um overview of of the um the meeting and and where things stand but to sort of summarize everything um there is still investigation going on into the um pow and battery fires um I believe there's been like four or five of them across the country. And so those have been fairly recent, like in the last six months. And so those are being investigated. And while those investigations are ongoing, there's not a lot of information um, for the applicant to share with us about the cause of the fire or the impacts of the fire. And so um, because of that, the applicant is basically asking the commission to move forward with approving the site plan as it's been presented to you um, and allow them time to complete their investigation and um, provide the reports back to the fire department and the electrical inspector um, and the um, town engineer so that they can determine whether the batteries are acceptable to the town of Amherst. Um, at which time, um, if there's a change to the battery configuration or the pad design or any other element of the project that they would come back to the commission for future approval. 
I, based on all of these meetings, conversations, I have drafted an order of conditions for consideration this evening, which I can pull up on the screen if the commission is interested in reviewing it. Um, but that's just a brief overview of sort of um, where things stand at the current time. And if there, if you'd like for me to pull up anything for review, I'm happy to do that. Thanks, Aaron. Um, I think it would be beneficial to take a look at that. Maybe uh, we can take a look at it uh, before uh, before the uh, commissioners uh, have questions, if it might uh, help to answer some of those. Um, and now uh, for the uh, for the applicants uh, turn at the mic. Um, I see we have uh, Matthew uh, Moyen here and uh, John Foster, as well as Lawrence Cup. Floor is yours. Yeah, it's, I, I, I'll take the lead here, and Nat and Lawrence jump in anytime. Uh, appreciate Aaron setting up that call yesterday with, um, or Tuesday, I should say, with with all the town departments. I think it was helpful just to understand what everyone needs. Um, but I think it um, at this point, I think we've gotten, you know, kind of closure on a lot of all the items that the uh, commission ha has asked for. You know, to, to kind of reiterate what um, Aaron was saying that we're, we're not seeking approval for, for these batteries. The, the approval is purely for the location and the pad. Uh, the approval of the, the battery is going to go through the town process to the, through the fire department and until they're satisfied, they cannot be installed. So that, that process will be separate and much longer. Much longer. Um, so. Um, I did. I did. Um, but you, yeah, Sean. I think that that, that kind of summarizes it. Thank you, Sean. Anyone else uh, from your uh, team there uh, have something to to say? I see that um, Lawrence uh, has something to say. Go ahead, Lawrence. Yeah, I just wanted to um, head off something that Erin said uh, with <laughs> there being four or five of the fires. I'm, there's, there's only two, well, only one of which was a. Uh, a battery in operation. The other one was uh, uh, due to a, um, a, a non-operational reason. Um, so unless she found out some additional power in fires that I'm not aware of, I just wanted to say that. But also on the on the general point, uh, yes, we th there's lots of things that we want to be able to share with the fire department and with the people in town. We've been asked not to buy power in at the moment while the, uh, the, the they fully conclude the 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 the, the, uh, the ends of the investigation with the town and with the fire department we if uh, anything the fire department has has us back in front of the zba or the concom we're more than happy to do that um the last thing we want is to have any problems on site so um it, it, we will it will be kind of fully uh, fully approved by the town and we'll come back if necessary and we're more than happy to do that thanks lawrence um aaron i just wanted to respond to the um uh, Lawrence's comment. It was uh, the the um, chief, uh, the fire department captain sent a link, and it was a, um, a battery failure link that was uh, nation. Um, it was a global battery failure um, link where they were documenting sites, and there was one in Rhode Island, two in New York, one in Idaho, and there was one which was on the Canadian border. Uh, they all referenced power and batteries. I don't know. I I just, uh, I didn't know the numbers or where the sites were just specific to that. I just looked at it quickly, but I don't, um, I don't want to misspeak, but that was just the okay. ones that were referenced on the website. Excellent. Thank you. I'll, uh, I'll look into that. All right. Thank you both. Um, Aaron, did you want to, uh, oh, there you go. You've got the, uh, the condition, uh, conditions up there. They are, they do look Fairly small to me, difficult to read. Um, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, I was trying to get two screens up at once. So um, just to give a quick rundown of sort of how I framed this, there's a finding of fact at the start, which basically outlines um, the discussions with the town um, relative to the, the batteries and that 
Um, ultimately, you know, the, the investigation reports were going to be provided back to various town departments and staff for review, and that um, once the review is made and the town has made a determination, if any change to the plan is necessary, the applicant would have to come back to the Conservation Commission for review and approval. There is a pretty extensive um, um, order of conditions here with special conditions and um, boilerplate. These are in your packet as well. And I only finished drafting these um, late yesterday afternoon, early this morning. So I apologize that these are like hot off the press. Um, they incorporate, I, I did speak to the applicant about, uh, I would say, 80% of these, uh, most of them are sort of a standard boilerplate um, that I would include on any project uh, of this magnitude. Um, but we did speak a lot about, <clears throat> for example, um, the phasing. Uh, there's there is a construction sequencing that's part of the project and doing kickoffs for the various phases. Um, uh, meetings, on-site meetings with the um, contractors and subcontractors, um, and uh, just monitoring the progress of the project, particularly once they get to the phase of installing the arrays, which is phase seven. You can see um, under phase seven, which is number four, um, there's, oh, crap, excuse me. Um, under uh, number four, phase seven, there's a broken out. Um, basically, they were hoping to start um, on both of the arrays at the same time. And um, basically what I'm doing is trying to give them as much flexibility as possible, but also contain the site disturbance as much as possible. And so it kind of breaks phase seven out into um, benchmarks for making sure that they have adequate stabilization um, throughout before they move on to <clears throat> from the Eastern Array to the Western Array and working through the Western Array. Um, so anyway, I can flip through these while we're looking at them, but um, they're, they go beyond one and two pages yeah. there. I can't um, read them. Um, so they are in the OneDrive if folks want to yep. open them, but um, I, can also try to zoom in a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Aaron, if these were put in the OneDrive, I didn't have a chance to read them. Yeah, that's fine. A lot of this is very last minute, so I was just doing what I could to tee it up. Yeah. All right. Um, Matt, looks like Matthew has a uh, comment or a question there. Uh, just a quick comment on special condition number two. Uh, I'd like to suggest adjusting that language slightly something along the lines of providing notification to the wetlands administration administrator a minimum of 72 hours prior to the following phases um, just so that you know obviously it would be, it'd be great for Aaron to still be around but if something changes uh, during construction we don't want to be held up by not having the wetland administrator attend, be able, able to attend a meeting at any of these phases during construction um, so just a minor tweak that I think still accomplishes the same goal, but won't hold up construct the construction process. Thank you, Matthew. I'm, I'm sorry, Matt. Could you, re I didn't quite follow everything you were saying. Could you repeat? <laughs> yeah, right, right now, special condition two is requesting that uh, the wetland administrator attend a pre-construction meeting at various phases during construction. Uh, and, and that's a little tricky. Uh, obviously, uh, we still want to make that happen, uh, but schedules, vacations, change in staff can, can create conflicts there that could bring construction to a halt or put us in non-compliance. Um, so I'm just suggesting we tweak the language that requires the applicant provide notification to the wetland administrator 72 hours prior to each of those phases. 
which would allow adequate time to to schedule a meeting and keep construction moving. So I'm I'm happy to build in some flexibility on that, but I do want there to be a meeting. Um, and we we dealt when we start started this initially for the sort of um, kickoff. It was working really well. Um, we various phases um, just did a quick site walk with the contractors and subcontractors that were working on the site. They signed off on the order of conditions. There was a lot of different subs and different contractors out there at that time. And so it was just useful for me because they weren't always out there all in one shot um, at the start of the project. Sometimes different contractors and subcontractors phase in depending on what phase of the project is under construction. For example, for the tree removal people, there's one group. For the um, earth moving people, there's another group. For the people who are installing the arrays, there's another group. And so they're not always on site for the first pre-construction meeting. Um, and so it's yeah. an opportunity for me to check in with the contractor that's starting work um, before they start work. But I like I said, I'm I'm happy to build in some flexibility. Certainly, if my availability is limiting um, the uh, ability for work to go on, that's not the intention. It's more so to just have an open line of communication and um, presence on site. Yep, understood and ag agree completely with that. It just gives a little bit of flexibility for the applicant to meet the condition uh, by providing you notification, and then obviously gives an opportunity for a meeting to be scheduled without stopping construction or putting us in non-compliance. Yeah, so maybe maybe something like a, uh, a two-week uh, notification rather than a 72-hour notification uh, or a two-week or, you know, some type of a notification and then uh, that a meeting would take place within two weeks. Uh, but I, I, it's obvious there that um, here that Aaron would like to uh, keep, you know, keep tabs and keep communication uh, lines open there. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think that a two week, I'm going to assume generally you have a two week look ahead schedule. And I think it's important for Aaron to meet with everybody prior to the start of that phase of construction, especially uh, in regards to um, 2D, their inspection of the previous phase stabilization measures. I'm going to make sure that if uh, each phase gets stabilized before the next phase starts, if required. And then uh, that, as Aaron said, that all the subcontractors understand their requirements for that particular phase of construction. So I think if if any kind of time frame is going to be put in there, the caveat should be put in there that the meeting has to, to take place prior to the start of that phase of construction. Yeah, and and uh, Matt, um, if as we move along or as you move along, uh, things aren't working out uh, and you do end up with issues, uh, you know, such as it's uh, it might be holding things back, then you could come back to us and uh, and uh, see about an administrative change, um, you know. But I I think that uh, to give the benefit of the doubt, um, and to to make sure that uh, you are in compliance, I I don't see a problem with uh, with ensuring that uh, Aaron's there. Um, Bruce, I think, uh, had a question as well. No, Bruce does doesn't have a question. Yeah. Anything else that you wanted to add, Matt? No argument on having Aaron there. It's just about putting a notification, giving the applicant an opportunity to have a notification requirement. So yeah, I'll, 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 I'll take as much flexibility as Aaron's willing to give. But uh, I echo Aaron; it, it did work very well. The early stages of this development, um, we'd like that can continue. Yeah, I think it'd be uh, the worst thing that could happen is if uh, uh, if she misses a meeting and something goes a little sideways and you're going to have to backtrack all of that uh and that that would be difficult i think uh, but i'll leave it at that alex uh, when it's commissioner's time to ask questions i have a couple okay anything else uh from the uh applicant uh, team before we move on 
Okay. Uh, how about from the public? Is there anybody from the public? Uh, please raise your hand. Um, I see that we've got uh, seven members in attendance right now. Um, please raise your hand if uh, you had a, a question or a comment. And if you, if you are with us online, uh, you raise your hand by uh, looking for a little hand raising uh, icon in the bottom middle of your screen. I see no hands, so uh, let's move on to, uh, I, to the connection. There, was, some, there was somebody raising their hand that was just like clicking around, um, but I did try to pull somebody in who had their hand raised. Okay. I don't know if it worked. I don't know if it worked. I don't see anyone else right now. Hmm. Okay. I don't know. Something seems to be funky. Um, it Somebody raised their hands. Um, oh, Mike Lipinski, Lipinski is in right now. So, Mike, go ahead, please. You're muted if uh, you're, if you haven't realized that. Hi, I'm not sure what happened there. My button wasn't working properly. Okay. So I'm, now I'm a participant. Yes. Okay. Um, I, I just wanted to uh, correct something that was said as far as uh, how many accidents there have been involving these poems, 750 batteries. There clearly was one in uh, Melba, um, Idaho on October 2nd that ran to about October 5th. It's the same type of uh, battery that is in question that's had the f fires from Warwick. And uh, basically they were claiming it was the same problem of water intrusion into the cabinet, which is consistent with what they were saying in Warwick, which was a, that the battery problem was a water intrusion problem. I'm pretty confident through the 750s. When you look at the pictures online, I sent you guys some of the materials. The cabinets look the same. I'm pretty sure it's the exact same model. Um, one of, the, one of the questions about using these particular batteries, and actually there's several, is why that um, Pure Sky is so insistent on using these when it's known that they have problems. Um, these are relatively new batteries. The Warwick site was one of the first places to use the batteries, and that's where the first fires broke out. And interestingly enough, another site, this Melba, Idaho site, used the same batteries and a few days after they actually initiated running the batteries, they caught on fire. So you have two incidents really near, close by um, in time within a six month period. Pure Sky is aware of it. We understand there's all these investigations going on. They're now going on for six months. Um, if you go back to the Warwick one, there's still no hard information about what exactly was the problem what kind of remediation is going to occur and how are they going to fix it? Um, if you ask me, the town of Amherst is taking a big chance here because you'll be buying a battery or having a battery installed in your property that really hasn't been tested out in the field. And the times it has been installed out in the field, it's burst into flames. Um, I don't understand why Pure Sky just doesn't switch to another battery. That seems to be the easiest solution here. You don't have to wait for an investigation. You don't have to wait for a fix for the battery. Just switch to another battery, and then you can just move along. There are plenty of batteries out there, including ones by Poen. As an example, um, Pure Sky has another facility in New York, in Dwaynesburg, New York. They reassured the town there that they weren't going to be using the Poen 750 batteries because the people in Dwaynesburg were well aware of what happened in Warwick. And so the project manager there reassured people in town that don't worry, we're not putting in the Poen 7, uh, 750s. We're using a different Poen battery. Seems to be an easy solution for Amherst and an easy solution for Pure Sky to keep things moving along is just switch to another battery. So I have a couple of questions. I'm wondering, does Pure Sky already own these batteries? And if you do, um, where are they now? And are these the old fire prone models or are these some new improved models? And how would we know they're safe? 
Yes. Also, are there any other Poen Centipede 750 batteries installed at any other Massachusetts sites? And if there are, where are they? And if they're not, why aren't they installed? Um, so that's all I have to say about batteries, but I do have a related issue. And we saw it in action once again um, over at Hickory Ridge this morning where the access road was under two or three feet of water again. When you tie that into this battery issue with a battery that could catch on fire and an access road that could be underwater, you have a recipe for a pretty bad situation. This is not an isolated incident of the access road at Hickory Ridge being underwater. It's happened three times in the last year. It doesn't have to have be a giant storm for it to happen. It happened a lot last night where we had a substantial amount of rain in a short period, not a long period. Snow melt and suddenly there's no access for emergency vehicles or for pure sky technicians to get across that river to work on whatever the problem is. I really urge Pure Sky to do the right thing here, switch to a safer battery. I urge the town to really look at that access road and give some serious thought on how you're going to make sure public safety officials have access to that site. No matter what the situation there, battery fire, other types of accidents, ambulances needed to get across. It doesn't seem to be a safe situation for me. Uh, I guess that's all I have to say for tonight. I'd like some answers to some of those questions if Pure Sky was willing to do it. Thank you, Mike, and I uh, appreciate your concern. Um, looks like uh, Lawrence was uh, has his hand up to uh, answer to begin answering. Yeah, I, I address certainly some of the relevant ones uh, to uh, uh, that were asked. So the. Uh, the batteries have already been acquired. They were ordered. Uh, I mean, we're very much delayed with this project, which was due to start. Uh, we were supposed to be completed a year ago. So those batteries have been uh, ordered. Uh, they're currently sat in a storage facility. Um, they uh, Our discussions with Powin relating to the fires is that uh, the, uh, the, uh, the build run that, that has had the problem is not the run that we've, um, uh, that we have purchased, that the, uh, uh, situation when it comes to install time is that there are uh, pre-delivery inspections that they will do which have already uh, been done to ensure that uh, the fire uh, the waterproofing is is there um, and then there's some additional things that get done uh, during the installation um, to uh, to add some uh, some some safety uh, additional safety to that as well um, so this is why we're confident with what Powin have suggested. Uh, what happened in Dwaynesburg, we didn't tell them that uh, we weren't using them. The Dwaynesburg project is an older project than this. It has the, uh, the battery technology um, that was uh, the generation before this. So we just explained that it, the, the type of battery that had the fire in that one was a different different technology. There was, there was no decision made not to put it there and there was no reassurance. It was just, just the timing. Um, and uh, yeah, the, as, as explained as well earlier on in this and in the, the call with the town, we cannot install these batteries until such time as the fire department, which is obviously uh, the people that should know uh, the risks uh, better than any of us. Um, they, we will not install them until such time as the fire department are uh, 100% happy and can sign off on, on them being installed. And whatever that takes, whether it's uh, inspections or, or certifications or, 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 or uh, uh, anything that they want to do to give them the comfort, we're happy to do that because at the end of the day, we're wanting the most safe and secure battery system as well. This is, this is the last thing we want is, is to have to deal with an issue on site. Um, so uh, it's in our interest as well to do this. And we, we want to just reassure you that Everything that can be done is being done, and uh, the town does have uh, the right people uh, to make the decision before uh, we're able to do anything anyway. So that's just all I wanted to say. Thanks, Lawrence. Now, uh, just to uh, come back around on the question, uh, is it the which, which battery is it that uh, you've got on order? It's the 750E, the power in centipede, yeah. Thanks, Lawrence. Um, Matthew, you had your hand up before. Uh, are you? Uh, do you still have something to say? 
No, no Lawrence, uh, the second half of what he was saying is exactly what I wanted to point out, that you guys aren't committing to anything specific tonight. The fire department will have final say. Okay, sounds like he covered it. Anybody, anybody else from the public? Okay, um, back to commissioners. I think Alex had a question before. Yeah, I, I would like to hear some response about uh, Mike brought up the flooding of the road and access. And um, I'd like to hear a response to that uh, from either the, the town or uh, your skies. Good point, Alex. Thanks. I, I have some. Other, I have something else to say, but one of Mike's questions was not answered, and I think it deserves an answer. Yeah, so, I, can, I can speak right, to that it. one, and Aaron or David, feel free to to jump in with our discussion that we had on Monday. Um, the The roads that are out there today have, had already been approved by the fire department. We'll be working with them as part of the battery approval and on any other conditions that they require for those battery installs, what that, you know, whether it's secondary access, it's changes to the existing access, that's all going to be part of the discussion. And in our meeting on Monday with all the stakeholders at, at, in the town, um, Pure Sky had committed to working with the town on potential uh, secondary access to the property uh, on the north side of Fort River, because it's something I believe both the town and Pure Sky um, would have some, would take, get some benefit from. Thanks. Um, David Zomek. Yeah, thanks, Andre. Yeah, I think Matthew covered it. Um, I think the the issue that Michael raises is is one that has been you know considered in front and center as recently as our our meeting earlier this week. Again, I think the fire department has has been mentioned numerous times tonight is really you know front and center in approving you know anything to do with public safety on the site will need to be signed off by the fire department so that includes the battery types and we've talked about those in some detail tonight and also considerations of access so as matthew said we're looking at um we have we have some access from the north, and we're trying to refine that at this point in terms of um, you know what that would be. Um, we know we can get to the arrays from the north. It's a question of how easy is it to get through uh, properties to the north, and does flooding, you know, um, I guess what I want to say is there are parts of the Hickory Ridge property in the northeast corner that also flood. So we're looking at that area as well as the northwest corner of the property. So uh, we know we can get there in an emergency. It's a question of what can we get there with in terms of equipment. So we're, we're, we're refining that. And as uh, Matthew said, Pure Sky is willing to work with us on that. And the, the fire department is, is of course around the table on all of those discussions. So thanks. Thanks, David. Alex, uh, any other, did, did that answer your question? Are there any other questions uh, from? I, I'm, I have, I'm not done. Okay. Um, from a, there's a couple of things I'm uncomfortable with. One is uh, I know that Aaron did a good job of trying to come up with something for us to uh, act on tonight, I'm a little concerned that it was cut off the press. And uh, I'm uncomfortable with not having had a chance to read it. And part of that might be my fault that I didn't visit the, the site uh, uh, close enough to the meeting. Anyways, um, in my opinion, this project's being segmented. We have, a request to go ahead and break ground so they're making commitments there um and then we want to segment it to a battery decision 
And at the same time, we're segmenting it to figure out how the fire department gets to the batteries if and when they catch on fire. And the town of Amherst will look very foolish in the papers if there's a if we install batteries, there's a fire and nobody can get to it. And Dave will look the worst because it's his project. And so we've segmented this thing several ways. And we're being asked to vote on this first advancement of the segmentation. I'm uncomfortable with that. I would rather see the whole project. Yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense, Alex. I I do think that it's that while they uh, try and figure out how to uh, how to address the battery issues, uh, the entire project is uh, is is kind of stalled until they figure this out. It's um, not our fault that they bought the batteries. They bought the batteries on the come. Maybe they got a good price. I'm sorry, you, you did interrupt me there, Alex. I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Um. So yeah, I mean, it does sound like uh like you've got doubts, and and I have doubts, um, some doubts, and maybe it's uh something that we need to kind of take a little. Let's let's see what other questions come up, but maybe we take a, a quick poll and uh, and. We may need to uh, revisit this down the road. Sorry about the uh, about that, Alex. Uh, go ahead now. Yeah, if I may, um, the project as proposed is the project that Pure Sky intends to build. The only changes that that may occur are as would be as a result of the fire department's input on the batteries themselves, which we have indicated we would be willing to come back whether it be an amended NOI, amended order, or it be a request for a minor modification. But what we have submitted is the project that is intended to be built in its entirety. Thanks, Matthew. Jason? Yeah. Um, I just want some clarification as far as what we're actually tonight, what's on the, the slide here is the motion is to, to close the public hearing and issue the order of conditions. It's my understanding that we, as the Conservation Commission, have no say one way or the other as far as what batteries get put in on this project. Is that correct? I think that's a question for uh, for Aaron. Um, I mean, we're we're approving or not the. Uh, um, the so, application, but yeah. Ahead. We're approving the notice of intent, right? Yeah. So I just, I, I have a couple, a couple things I want to just mention here. The first is we have two additional hearings this evening, and we've already exceeded our twenty-minute allotment. Um, I'll defer to you, Andre, as to how you want to handle that. Um, to address um, Jason's question, Jason, you know, as far as the batteries are concerned, from a public safety standpoint, it is the fire department. From an environmental standpoint, it's the Conservation Commission. From uh, the standpoint of wetland resources, it's the Conservation Commission. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of where our jurisdiction lies, is the impacts to surface water, groundwater, um, stormwater systems on the site, all of the resource areas that we have jurisdiction over, which include the river, the riverfront area, the floodplain, um, the wetlands on the site. And so um so yes yeah, so then our concern is is that there's a fire potentially the fire department can't get to it burns or when the fire department comes they're using water to put the fire out all that stuff runs off into the resources right so we're looking at more of we're we're trying to right now figure out is there a likelihood that these batteries are going to catch fire and there's going to be some sort of impact to the resources? Right. And I did include in the finding of fact in the draft order that the Conservation Commission be provided with the reports um, and the findings from the investigations. I don't know if that includes any environmental remediation that might be associated with the fires. Um, for example, if it causes any kind of, you know, impacts from the the fire suppression or you know that's kind of an aside but um 
I, I mean, I think that, that there's elements, and that's one of the, Dave and I talked about this, one of the interesting things about this project is the interface of, of public safety and the Conservation Commission on this project, which is unique, um, I feel like, compared to other projects that we might work with. So do we have the ability to, I know Alex is saying the project, or it seems to be segmented, and Andre also has concerns about that. Um, are we able to, is there anything that we can do as far as um, potentially closing this public hearing or allowing this to project to move forward with some sort of conditions based upon batter, you know, what, I guess also I'm, do we have recourse to stop project or do something if we close the public hearing tonight? And then what, what, are the other commissioners looking for as far as what would abate your concerns or like how would we how what 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 do you all want to see to so we can move this forward one way or the other there there is a condition that if um additional information is brought to the attention of the conservation commission that they um reserve the right to um, take that information into consideration relative to the order of conditions um, and determine if there's any changes to the order that are necessary as far as conditions are concerned. Um, I guess where I'm coming from as staff, and I've been in this position many, many times with these permits, I know that the applicant is in a hurry to get their permit. I know that they've waited patiently um, for their permit. It seems like the Conservation Commission um, is feeling a little apprehensive tonight. So I would recommend that Andre maybe take a poll to see who's comfortable to it, issue an it, approval it, tonight and close the public hearing. And if um, if there are commissioners, so the, the other issue that we should explain to the applicant is we have a seven member board. Tonight, there are four members present. In order to pass this project, you would need a unanimous approval from all four members. So it's really important that we get a read from the members present, whether they would be willing to vote for an approval tonight. If they are not, I would highly recommend that the applicant request a continuation to the next meeting in order to allow the commissioners who aren't in attendance tonight to view the the hearing proceedings and be able to vote at the next meeting. And it may give the commissioners an opportunity to review the information that came in last minute, um, potentially give the applicant a little more um, opportunity to review the draft orders of conditions, which they haven't really had a chance to see. We could wordsmith some changes and potentially um, consider it at the next meeting, but just a suggestion depending on where people are at of different options. Yeah, it's a very good point there, Aaron. Um, Can, would I just be able to say yeah. one thing before we do that poll? I think what yeah, Aaron yeah, Lawrence is is well, I think Lawrence, what Aaron said. Lawrence, you have a turn. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So All right. I no, to... it's not no, it's not your turn yet though. Um, just just hang on, okay? You'll get it. You'll get a chance, Lawrence. Um, I I think that's a I think that's a really good suggestion, Aaron. Um. As far as taking a, a poll and uh, and the fact that uh, there will be more of us hopefully next uh, next meeting and we do uh, we may need um, a little more time to uh, look at the uh, these conditions and and to discuss uh, uh, we may I think we don't have a lot of uh, a lot of time to discuss things right now anyway um, it, Alex why don't you go ahead with your question and then we'll uh, go to Lawrence. Yeah, I didn't have a question. I just wanted to just uh, um, get back to Jason on jurisdiction. And in addition to what Aaron said, we labored over batteries on another solar project up on Sunderland Road, um, 116. And we were concerned about containment of materials to put fires out. We had drain pipes to make sure that um, it didn't it didn't go into the groundwater. We spent a lot of time on it, and it was very clear that it was our jurisdiction. So I don't think there's a question about whether or not uh, we have jurisdiction to to talk about batteries. Um, so it isn't just. Um, uh, anyways, that's my comment. Um, 
to to clarify that and to bolster what what Aaron said, I think we're very comfortable or should be very comfortable uh, on that subject. And from a from a resource standpoint, um, our jurisdiction is not public safety. That's that's the fire department. But um, I I'm I'll just that's all I really wanted to say at this point. Uh, if it came to a vote, uh, I'll, uh, I think Pure Sky has the ability to move this off the dime. Their choice is to segment it, but they have the ability to move it off the dime. If the batteries they bought are having a problem with getting approval, then pitch the batteries and buy something else. It may cost you a lot of money, but it'll move your project forward a lot quicker. In this waiting game. Thanks, thanks, Alex. Okay, Lawrence, it's your turn. Thanks for okay. so, uh, I'll, I'll kind of go backwards and, and kind of address what some of that's done. The, the batteries to this project would not happen until we have the utility connection, uh, which is not going to be until uh, end of Q3, so end of September. So once that happens, we will need to have a, a, a witness test for the uh, solar PV, and then we that would get the power that would run the, the, the batteries to the site. So we have 11 months to be able to discuss with the, uh, the fire department and get the permission. The, the fire department um, have said what they need to be able to provide the permission. We are comfortable and confident that what they have said uh, they need, we will be able to supply in due time once we have the release from the battery supplier. So that is why we're not we're not sort of saying we're, we're sort of pushing it. We're saying that we do not believe, based on third party engineering uh, reports that we have been privy to, that this is going to be an issue and that but that process is taken on by the fire department. So and, and then coming back, absolutely, the Conservation Commission has the jurisdiction to do with the um, uh, any contaminants and things and protection of the resource. That's precisely why we have put some mitigation measures in there with the, the, the way that the pad is designed and the channel that runs around the outside and the, uh, the, the, the hydrocarbon barrier. And, and we've had endless discussions with Erin um, to do with the, the actual design of the batteries, the fact that there's no uh, penetrations from underneath and there's a, there's a four inch sort of uh, base to them. So any of the chemicals within it, can, um, it have got 99% containment for the amount of um, uh, equipment that's in there. All of this has been discussed at length with Erin and, and, and at, at the time uh, when we were looking at the batteries, Last um, um, last January and things like that, with the discussions that we've been having, this this is we we feel that we we've, we've kind of got to the point where uh, the Concom doesn't necessarily want to detect uh, dictate the protections, but the actual battery itself, and that's why there's a, the, the jurisdictional thing. The protections is is if if you don't feel that it's adequately protected, then tell us what you what you think is, is is you're more required because what we've done is what has been agreed by both the fire department and Aaron um, in, in those conversations. So it's, it's really just to kind of put the point that what we wanted to do, and we, I understand that people are going to want to read those conditions. We're not asking you to vote to approve those conditions tonight. So I'm happy for those to get discussed at the next meeting and we can discuss the conditions. But I feel that there's, we, we've really provided all the information that's been asked of us at this stage um, no one's come up with anything that we can actually provide at the moment uh, that, that is to do with protection of resource or, th or anything that, that's in the jurisdiction. All the questions seem to be about the, uh, the, the battery provider, and, 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 and that's really the fire department um, is, is going to make sure that that happens. We, we want to make sure that this part can move forward and that we've got 11 months to be able to work with the fire department. And if the fire department don't approve the power in batteries for whatever reason, then they don't get installed. But we are confident, based on the, the, all the discussions that we have had, that what they will require for us to be able to provide, for them to allow us to be able to do it, we will be able to provide. We just can't do it at the moment because we're un under an NDA from, from Powering and can't share these documents with the people. That's the only reason. But we have time. Thanks, Lawrence. I, I, look, I, uh, I can sense that um, uh, that uh, the some frustration there uh, in from your end of things. It, uh, let me just, you know, agreeing with you on some of these points, let me just also uh, uh, point one thing out here is that 
you know the the what we're concerned about is is the protection and as you said is the protection of the uh, resource now the uh, level of protection that uh, that it's going to take also depends on the threat to the uh, resource to the environment and the threat um right now is still somewhat up in the air because we are not sure what uh, uh as far as the safety of these batteries so uh understanding where you're coming from i think uh it's also uh but, but, yeah, it's, it's just, also just, good to 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 have a uh the the realistic perception or the uh but the protection, protection the, i'm sorry the perception that uh uh that what we're doing is we're protecting the resource um and it depends somewhat on the safety of those batteries, Lawrence. Uh, it's this isn't really. A, I don't really mean to do this back and forth thing, but yeah, well, no. I, I mean, I, I understand what you're saying, but the protections that we've provided and the protections that have been requested of us to do assumes that it is going to burn. That's why we've put the protections in there. That that it. it so if it, we we're very hopeful that it doesn't. But the reason why it's been put in there is to account for the fact that if it does. So that's why I'm saying that it's like it, it, it seems to be not about um, it's about the, the, the battery uh, manufacturer itself rather than the protection at this point, because we, we provided this protection that is assumed that it's going to fail and that the, the things are going to leak and we're going to be able to protect the resource from it. But. OK, thank you, Lawrence. Aaron. Um, I'm just concerned about time, uh, so I'm advocating because we have people for the next hearing who are sitting yeah. online, and we've gone we'll continue. over. Yeah, please, if we can. Hey, Lawrence, um, just let's take turns here. Okay, um, Aaron, um, what uh, I what I think we should do here is perhaps if. Um, if uh, conservation commission members would like to, we can um, we can revisit this next week. And I think that's uh, I I don't think I'm ready to vote at this point. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't I don't think I'm ready to vote for anything other than that. But I'll I'll let's see. Uh, what uh, let's take a quick poll um jason what 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 are your thoughts i am in favor of a continuation okay alex alex you're muted continuation but i also have a request for next meeting so after the poll, please come back to me. All right, Bruce. Continue. All right. Um, so, how about we? Uh, uh, how about we leave our questions and comments and so on? I know uh, Alex, you can you you do have a you do have a quick question. Uh, go ahead. Um, but let's uh, let's 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 look for a motion. Yes, yeah, so my, do I have the permission to speak? Yeah, please. We have that other issue of the road being flooded and access if there was a fire. And um, um, I would like to see something come forward before we vote on this project that that issue has been resolved. And that sort of, I think Dave can probably move that along. Um, but this seems to be an oversight that could be quite embarrassing if there was a fire and we have to use some sort of uh, uh, aquatic vehicle or something to, Dave says he doesn't know how they would get out to it. And I would like some clarification on that before we vote on it. Okay, so before, uh, before the next uh, meeting, you'd like to uh, kind of see what kind of plan there uh, uh, there could be, right? Right. 
All right. Do we have uh, do we Andre, have... may I briefly? Uh, I'm sorry. May I briefly before we uh, vote? Yeah, please do. And Lawrence, your hands up. I don't know if you're looking to uh, to say something or no. No. Okay. As it relates, <laughs> yeah. As it relates to the access roads, those are not part of this NOI filing. Those have been approved. Those are an existing condition under this NOI filing. Um, so that 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 should not be a part of the consideration. As it relates to the, the safety element and the protection of the resource areas, I think Lawrence hit that pretty well on the head. Um, this is really no different from a single family home that catches fire. The fire plating con contaminants that, that, that can occur in any, any project, any condition. Um, and the one request I have for the commission as we, as we part ways tonight is to provide us with some clarity on what you are expecting the applicant to provide in addition to what we have already provided to date so we can take steps to move forward. Thanks, Matthew. Thank you. So, yeah, and, and we, you know, we will, we will need to uh, have a little more discussion on this next, uh, next meeting and you may have some better uh some some uh some more uh succinct or concrete uh requests anybody for the motion i will motion that we move to continue the public hearing for 191 west palmroy lane to 124 2024 at 7 45 p.m second that's uh, Jason with the motion, uh, Bruce with the uh, second. Uh, Bruce? Aye. Jason? Aye. Alex? Aye. And I'm an aye. So it'll be moved to uh, the 24th. Um, and, uh, and to uh, Mike uh, Lipinski, uh, Lawrence, and um matthew and sean thank you for uh for your uh for what you've uh, brought to us today thank you Pre appreciate everyone's time tonight see you on thank the you. Thank take you. care thank you okay now move to the uh eighth hearing of the of the night um <laughs> and this is a uh Request for determination. Um, by Ty uh, Ty and Bond on behalf of Eversource uh, for soil borings. Um, Andre, we will need to do the hearing call for this meeting. We will need to do it. Okay. Yes, because it's opening so, tonight. Mm -hmm. Hang on one second, I'll find it. Okay, this public meeting is now called to order. Uh, this meeting is being held as required by the provisions of Chapter 131, Section 40 of the General Laws of the Commonwealth, an act relative to the protection of wetlands, as most recently amended in Article 3.31, Wetlands Protection under the Town of Amherst General Bylaws. Um, again, tie and bond on behalf of Eversource uh, for soil borings and installation of monitoring locations uh, to evaluate and delineate the presence of uh, dense non-aqueous uh, phase liquids, DNAPL, and other potential contaminants within riverfront area, watering land subject to fluttering uh, at Pelham Road. Um, At Pelham Road. Okay. Aaron? Yeah. So just to give the uh, commission a little bit of background on this, um, this is a, an existing site. It was a previous um, gas manufacturing site, and um, there's known contaminants on the site that have been monitored for um, as long as I think I've been with the town, at least. Um, 
the uh, Eversource approached me uh, about the project. Um, they're looking to do some uh, test pits and some monitoring wells out there. The test pits are actually exempt under the minor activities. Um, However, they are um, accessing through resource areas to get to the test pit sites. So that coupled with the fact that they're installing monitoring wells um, uh, triggered the need to have an RDA filing. Um, that being said, I have drafted um, a determination tonight um, with conditions, and I do support the issuance of the determination to allow this because it's the first step towards the site being fully assessed for potential future remediation efforts to basically clean it up. Um, I have the order available and the site visit photos available to share, so I'll queue those up um, and give the applicant an opportunity to present anything they'd like to say. Thanks, Aaron. Um, on behalf of the applicant, uh, we have, uh, our, am I right, that uh, Saskia Osting and uh, Seth Taylor are here on behalf of the applicants? Correct. And my apologies if I butchered your names. Oh. All right, go ahead and present. Okay, I'll mute myself. Uh, how you doing, guys? My name is Seth Taylor. I work for Tynebot Project Manager, representing Eversource. Um, for a site for um, some exploratory borings, um, 13 borings total um, to look for uh, get an apple. Saskia, do I have this right? Uh, uh, dense non aqueous liquid to have that right. <laughs> um, so, um, one of the things we, we talked about a couple of different things at the, at the, um, site walk. Um, and one of the things that I did want to actually show the commission was, um, it came up a question about the, um, tracked, um, vehicle that's going to go out and 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 do the borings and so um Aaron Jews is okay if I share my screen is that all right? sure yep um so I did want to I did want to actually show what they actually look like um so when the when they're entering the site they're going to have to clear brush there aren't any trees um that are proposed to be removed but as you can see that there is going to be some shrubs and stuff that will have to be removed. Um, that is a track vehicle. Um, this will again, all be in upland, uh, riverfront, BLSF, um, part of it's in buffer, some of it's, um, out. Um, but this is what it's going to look like going into the site. Um, and so they're going to go out, they're going to do 13 total borings, um, I believe it's eight of which, nine of which are um, well casings are going to be installed, uh, two inch diameter up to 25 feet uh, depth. And those are going to be left uh, for a period of time to allow for sampling, you know, over that time. Um, for the four borings that will not have wells, the spoils will be put back inside of the hole. And for the nine where the wells are going to be installed, that soil we propose to um, store in 55 gallon drums. It's an estimate of about eight drums. Um, and at that time, it will be determined um, with testing what needs to be done with that soil um, afterwards. But that'll be disposed of per the you know testing requirements. Um, you know, to align landfill or it'll be disposed of. <laughs> um, and so the, we, um, we also discussed installing um, erosion controls. So there are um, three or four um, locations in particular that are close to BBW and Riverfront on the Fort River. And so um, per Eversource standards, we're going to install we propose to install um, biodegradable straw waddles, um, straw in particular, uh, with you know non-invasive seeds in them, and so that they, they can um, 
biodegrade over time without having to be removed from the site. And anywhere where there's disturbance, where there's going to be um, rutting, this again will be in upland areas, um, seed and hay will be installed to ensure that um, natural vegetation can grow back over time. And those, those were the topics that we discussed on the site, uh, the site walk. Um, but other than that, um, uh, I'm open to questions about um, any of the process. Um, so maybe Sasuke can answer more of the technical questions on the actual testing, but, uh, but, um, but yeah, let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Seth. Um... Is yeah, I, I, um is it okay if I say something too? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, thank you um for your time for this uh, work forever source. Um, I, as as Seth said, um, you know this is this is work obviously that's being done in order to further the investigation. This work's been going on by EverSource since two thousand and two, so it's um you know. It's a it's a long term project, and um, we're just trying to get an, uh, an some additional assessment done um, after we've been operating some um, pumping system that has been removing this denapple um, for probably about fifteen years, um, and this denapple is a it's like a an oily substance, and it's um, it's a byproduct of the gas plant that operated at the site. So um, obviously this is, this is just investigation work. It's, you know, we're not building anything um, other than those wells that are um, gonna, you know, be there for some period of time um, while this work is going on. Um, happy to answer any other questions you guys may have. Thank you. Um... Now we'll uh, turn to the public for uh, for any questions or comments from the public. I see we do have two members of the public there. Um, if you have any questions, please raise your hand. I see no questions from the public, so... Uh, um, with that, uh, then it's up to uh, the commissioners. Do we have questions? Alex has a question. Go ahead. Yeah. Bruce and Aaron and I went on the site visit and um, we're involved in this project because it's along the Fort River. Um, the the um, question I have for Eversource is, uh, I, I just want to make sure my perception of the project and what I've read is what you're trying to do is find how far the tars, if I if they are tar, uh, how far they have spread horizontally and vertically um, so that you can come up with some sort of a uh, remediation plan. Is that correct? Um, good question. Um, yes. Um, we have largely delineated where this material has um, come to be located, but some of the borings that we're proposing around the sort of the more the perimeter um, are just to sort of tighten the, the spacing between borings. Um, the way this material, this isn't like oil that like floats on water. The reason it's called dense is that it's denser than water. So when it hits water, it keeps sinking until it hits a um, confining layer. So something that's much less permeable. And um, out in the Amherst area, there's um, the lake bed deposits from Glacial Lake Hitchcock that are basically a clay layer. And whatever the shape of that clay layer is, is how is, is what determines where the material will go because it literally will hit that um, that layer, and if it's sloped in one direction or another, that's the direction that this this denapple will 
sort of flow and it's 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 not um it's more like the consistency of like you know honey or <laughs> or molasses or something it's not um stuff that's rapidly running in any direction but so some of it is to delineate laterally some of it is to also assess um how much of this material we're going to be able to feasibly get out of the ground. Um, we've been operating these pumping systems um, for 15 years and we're just trying to get some additional information to further understand, um, you know, what, what more can be done. And, and, um, and in some cases when these, the um, we've got some large recovery wells that have the pumps in them and they're screened not quite to that clay layer. So we're trying to put in some new wells that are fully penetrating that um, layer um, above the clay that has the Dean apple in it. So um, some of the technical things, I don't wanna bore you too much, but um, does that answer your question, Alex? Yeah, and my hand, <clears throat> my hand keeps disappearing, even though I have a follow-up question. Um, I'm, I'm, thank you for the clarification on its uh, viscosity. So what's the chances that it moves, has moved or is moving into the, the Fort River? Um, well, we, we haven't seen it in the Fort River that I'm aware of. Um, I, we, you know, there's no, I mean, unless, you know, somebody has been seeing sheens, but I, I, you know, we haven't seen that. Like I said, it's stuff that um, this, this uh, material is sinking um, when it hits the water table. So it, it, um, it's not going with the water table, um, but it's certainly something that, um, we will further investigate too as part of you know follow-up studies right now we're um you know just focusing on the you know the mobility of this material and how much more there is in the ground that that we could possibly get out yeah so i was i was glad to go on the site visit and see that the machine can move easily between the trees and that we don't have to have a lot of um, road building or tree clearing I think the machine can go over a lot of the shrubs. Maybe some of them need to be cut, but it could probably just move right over some of them. Yeah, to the extent that they can, they certainly will do that. I mean, we don't, yeah. you know, if, you know, blueberry bushes and things like that, they can usually pop right back up. And, you know, if some, you know, if we need to. A lot of us have worked on the Fort River, have been aware of this deposit for a long time. Very nice to see Eversource taking a hand and trying to get a hand and trying to understand it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Alex and Saskia. Uh, anybody else from the, uh, oh, looks like Jason has a question and so does Bruce after. Uh, yes, thanks. I just wanted to ask about the barrels of the spoils that will be kept on, that will be stored. Where are they going to be stored? How are they going to be stored? And how long are they going to be stored? Um, very good questions. Um, the northern side, so so the the our work is both on the north side of the road and the south side of the road. Um, the northern side um, is fenced. Um, Mrs. Luddy's property, um, you know, has a fence around it. The south side is not. Um, so the the you know, and, and on both sides, as you probably have seen, you know, you can see it just driving by the road, there's a little shed um, where our pumping equipment is. So the drums would be stored on the north side by the shed, um, you know, hopefully not, you know, too visible from the road, but, um, you know, near, near that shed and it'd be inside the fence. So should, you know, keep people out um, unless they're really trying. And then um, the duration at which, so, uh, you know, um, it probably isn't even eight drums, but, you know, um, but the duration of storage is until we have um, 
have the the testing that we need in order to get the materials off site, you know, to a proper disposal facility, and then we get a um, a truck on site to to get those picked up and taken away. I mean, we we pretty routinely two or three times a year um, have a truck coming by to pick up drums that are generated inside the you know filled inside those sheds from the material that we're pulling out of the ground. So that's a pretty routine operation that we do. And how will they be stored? Are they are they going to be in some sort of secondary containment? Are they going to be under a temporary roof? My concern is that if we have this material on the on the barrels or the barrels somehow get um, penetrated and this leaks out, that it's not just going back into the ground. Um, these these drums um, these drums are designed to. I mean, these are you know. They're, they're new drums. Um, they're, you know, we're, we're, we're talking storing them for a few weeks. It's not months or, you know, a long-term period. Um, and and um, so, you know, no, they won't have secondary containment, um, but I don't anticipate that that's needed. Will they be labeled? Yes. They're, so, you know, all drums are supposed to be labeled with you know what's in them when they were generated and and they can only be stored on site for you know uh, a certain period of time so um and it's just you know we have to collect the samples get the data back from the lab and we're probably talking like a month or something not you know not, not much more than that all right thank you you're welcome thanks bruce so we were on the site visit with Mr. Taylor, and I'm sorry I don't remember the exact specifics of, but he showed us a map of where the floodplain was, the uh, land subject to flooding. And I just wonder, I went out there yesterday morning, and the Fort River was roaring. It was very close to the bottom of the bridge the road bridge, and it was much, much wider in its extent than when we were out there on the side, side visit. And I just wonder whether the, the boundaries on your maps are based on where it actually is going and conditions like yesterday morning or from, you know, some mapping thing. So, and I want, don't, and does it matter whether if the floodwaters came up to where your your test pits and test boring uh, pipes are, would it matter? Because it might. Are, are you asking whether it matters to our work? Well, to the health of the resource, but yes, to your we want your your work to succeed too. So, <laughs> it sure. I mean, the 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 extent out was quite dramatic. Yeah, I mean those those elevations are determined by FEMA, and so and that was the, I can I can put that map up on the screen again if you want. Um, no, I'm just asking a conceptual question about to the extent that the floodwaters are going much further if they are than it was on that map. Um, would it matter to the project? I don't think during they wouldn't do the active work if it was flooded, so. While they do it, they're going to, you know, take out the materials and then they're going to put them back in and cap it. Um, okay. With the benzenite, is that right? So like an in, impermeable layer so that if it does flood again, if they won't, you know, the water won't go into the hole, grab the denapple and then pull it back out and then go back. To Fair the enough. Room. Yeah. I would just urge you to go out there and look at how the extent of the distance that it moved out of its normal um, uh, stream bank and just look at it and make your own determination. And then at, when it rains three or four more inches uh, tomorrow night, maybe go look at it again. Because <laughs> this is going to keep happening. Yeah. All right. Thank you, uh, Aaron. 
I just had a couple ideas. Um, you know, if we want to condition it for lower flow conditions, um, that might be a good idea just to make sure that when the work is done, and I don't know the exact duration of the work, but I imagine probably a couple days at least to do the work, um, but to make sure that it's scheduled during, con you know, conditions when it's not raining. And then another potential condition, and this was just relative to the barrel storage was whether it would be possible to either put the barrels inside the shed or put some type of um, construction fencing around the barrels so they're not accessible. My concern is, um, you know, there's, there is an elementary school right across the street from this site. And also um, there was previously, there was a house, it was like a um, an abandoned house that was people were getting into it and um, causing mischief. And so, you know, just the concern that people would see barrels there and like, oh, let's smash these or, you know, dump them out or do something crazy with them. Um, and so at least if they were behind a secure fence, maybe that would deter um, anybody from messing with them over the period of time when they're there. Because there's really not a lot of houses or visibility of that site. Like there's a business kind of across the street, but there's no one there at night and there's no one really around that location. So just to provide an added measure of security might not be a bad idea. Um, Aaron, they are going to be inside a fence. Um, the northern side of the property where that shed is, where those drums would be placed is fenced and at the gate is locked unless there's somebody from tie and bond or ever source on site. Okay. So, Cause the, 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 the little brick shed, is that what the shed you're talking about? Because that's not fenced in. No, that's not that's not our shed. That's oh, okay. a sewage pump station. Oh, okay. I think you're talking about like okay. right next to the farm field. There's okay. like a there's there's um there's a wooden shed it's, it's inside the in. fence. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Like you if the next time you drive by the road you'll see it and then okay. you'll see the fence right there. Right. So okay. it, it, everything will be inside a fence and okay. and it would literally be somebody having to either take bolt cutters or climb okay. a fence and fair enough I, th I was thinking I and now that you mentioned the, the pump station I um realized that I, I was thinking for some reason that that was the same one in the same shed but that makes sense okay okay great all right great um and I did I did have a question as well um Seth you were mentioning that uh, these shafts are two inches in diameter um when you're uh putting a casing in it what about the you said there were a certain amount i think it was four or eight i forget um that did not that are not going to have casing um is that the same uh diameter as the as these other two inches right so there's 13 total that are going to be dug out. Four of them will not have wells installed. I don't know the diameter of that. Maybe Sasuke can speak to that, but those will be filled back in. The diameter of the wells that are being installed, it's a two-inch diameter. Okay. Yeah, so, that, the, the, the drill, sorry. Please. Okay. The drilling technique we're using is something called direct push. Um, so literally, they, they, they push... Um, like a, a steel casing into the ground. And then there's a plastic sleeve inside that so that we can actually collect the sample so we can see what's in the soil. Um, that material comes out, but it, that that's it. There isn't a lot of cuttings. Um, and, you know, in locations where we're not putting wells in, those materials are, are just gonna be put right back into the same hole. And, um, in those other ones, we would uh, obviously put in wells and then they would have the stand pipes, which are sim similar to the ones that you've seen out there. Because if we do something that's flush with the ground, we'll never find it again in the woods. <laughs> right. yeah. Okay. All right, great, thank you. And uh, Aaron, do you still, uh, do you have a, another question? No, sorry, I just forgot to put my hand down. <laughs> no problem. Uh, Alex? Yeah, just a, a dumb question for either Eversource or Titan Bond. I take it the barrels will be labeled according to the hole where the dirt came out. And the reason I ask is, I think you said that depending on the test results, they'll either be hauled away or um, 
uh, put back on site. Did I hear that correctly? No, we just need the test results to um, to characterize the material so that the facility where it's going will will have information as to what's in the what's in the material. Um, once it goes into a drum, it's not going to come back out on the site. The whole purpose for drumming materials is so that the, then it, the, the next place it goes is an off-site facility. Oh, okay. My hand disappeared. I didn't know that I, am I allowed to still talk? Yeah, sure. I, I don't, I don't know what's happening with your hand, but, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I keep getting messages saying it appears that you've finished talking. Anyways, um, so all of it is all of it is leaving the site. I was not under that impression. I thought somehow if the sample from a particular well was clean, that it could be redeposited in the hole or something of that sort. But uh, no need to discuss it further. I think I'm clear. All right, Alex, thanks. Um... Looks like we're uh, ready for a motion, unless anybody else has uh, has anything. I will move to issue a positive determination of applicability checking box five and negative determination of applicability checking box two. However, special conditions and boilerplate conditions as drafted shall be required and attached to the determination under the Wetlands Protection Act and Wetlands Protection Town of Amherst General Bylaws, Article 3.31 and regulations. Second. All right, that's uh, Jason on the, mo on the motion and uh, Bruce on the second. Bruce. Aye. Jason. Aye. Alex. Hi. And I'm an I. So, positive determination. Thank you. Thanks very much to uh, to both of you for uh, waiting till the end. And to anyone else who's there, I see no other attendees <laughs> other than the participants currently. <laughs> so you all have a good uh, good night. Thanks for your uh, thanks for your your. Uh, your testimony or your uh what you've brought to uh to bear here thank you have a good night you too. Thank you very much so now we're uh uh hearing number nine um <laughs> yeah it, i have good news uh this is a uh, wendell uh wetman services uh for 260 Leverett Road, um, and they have requested uh, to move it forward to the 24th of January at 7.45 p.m. So we'll need a motion. I will move to continue the public hearing for 260 Leverett Road to 124.24 at 7.50 p.m. Second. That's uh, Jason on the motion and Alex on uh, the second. Um, Alex, do you, uh, did you have a question before? Uh... Yes. Okay. Um, I had a question about why it's a redevelopment project. Maybe this is a technical thing that Aaron can ask or answer. Why is it redevelopment? It looks to me like it's a conversion of use. Um, and maybe that's one and the same. I just don't understand the technicalities. Uh, because you had a single family house or you're going to have a single family house where there was a garage and a chicken coop. Yeah. So under the riverfront redevelopment regulations, there's a very specific definition for redevelopment, which is um, basically having a, a anything covering it, which prevents uh, vegetation from growing. Um, there's a whole variety of definitions of what that might be. So in this case, structures or gravel driveways um, would qualify as previously disturbed or previously altered areas of river, riverfront on the site. Um, and so those areas can be taken into consideration for new development. Um, so that's that's why it's referred to as a redevelopment project. And frequently when there's riverfront redevelopment, they will claim that because the requirements are less stringent than the um 
basically new development um, on a uh, riverfront area. Um, on this one, we received an application. Um, the The plan was not sufficient. Um, it was a hand-drawn, not to scale. It didn't include everything that they were proposing to do, so I kicked it back to them immediately. Unfortunately, DEP issued a file number on it, which I wish they hadn't have done, but they did. Um, I'm not even sure that they looked at the plan when they issued it. Um, I did speak to DEP about that and said, this is kind of unacceptable to issue this when we they they were proposing a septic system and the septic system wasn't even shown on the plan. Um, <clears throat> so anyways, the, we had to open the hearing within 21 days, which is why the hearing, op you know, is, is on the agenda tonight. But I did let the applicant know they needed to revise the plan if they were going to be considered. So they're, they're working on revising it. And that's why there's a continuation tonight. Well, glad I asked the question. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Uh, All right, so we're looking for a motion. Uh, I think we lost uh, Jason there, or did we? No. Uh, oh, no. Okay, you know what? You disappeared because of the shared screen. I'm sorry. I move to continue. I can't read it now. Oh, we already we already made the motion, and there was a second. We just need a oh, vote. that's right. That's right. Okay, so, so uh, let's start with the votes. Alex? Yes. Aye. Jason? Aye. Rose? I and I'm an I. So this is continued to uh, the twenty fourth at um, seven fifty. Seven forty five. Are we going to have a site visit? Um. Yeah, we will. We will before the hearing opens. Yes. Okay. And we've gone through the other business already, uh, so I think... Minor administrative change. That's going to be tabled to the next meeting. Uh, the applicant couldn't attend tonight, so... Okay. There's nothing for us to do then. Right. Just wait. Okay. Exactly. So I think we're, uh, we're done. This was a really... Uh, long arduous meeting with a little bit of uh bumpiness there uh, you guys did great everybody did thank you yes i move we adjourn i second awesome as, as the chair can i third it um <laughs> so uh let's I'll forfeit. It. <laughs> Sorry. so so note that we're ending at 18. uh-huh yes and so uh Let's uh let's vote Bruce. Aye. Jason. Aye. Alex. Uh, you can abstain, but I I <laughs> you can't abstain or we can't leave. And I'm an I. Um thanks guys. Thanks everyone. Good night. All right. Thank, yeah, you. thank you everybody. Have a good, good night. night.